Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Kagaya Adatsuki give all chakra to Naruto. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Yuzumaki Shirachka and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. A long time ago. The world was nothing. The world was still young. Untamed and dangerous with great ferocious creatures roaming the wilds. This was the time before, before nations, before history. Before even myth. The time where the land, as it is called today by its descendants, is known as the land of ancients. Soon the age of legends and the creation of the elemental world began, heralded by the descent of the rabbit goddess Kagayal Tatsuki began. The Gaia came to the earthly realm to see all that there was, she found it lacking and primitive, so she planted the god tree. And from the tree life sprouted and the mortals, humans came to be. Seeing this miracle Kagaya was awed but worried of the fragile beings as they were not gods like her, so she beseeched the heavens on what to do, she was told to divide the lands into five nations named after the five elements. Fire, wind, water, lighting, and earth. But this done Kagaya was tasked with being the protector of the earth. And she stayed with the mortals, teaching them and showing them how to survive and make the most of their short lives. In this time, she would take a lover, and eventually the man became the emperor of the land of ancients, with Kagaya as his royal concubine. And he would love her and they lived in happiness. But other mortals saw this and they feared, they believed the emperor would be blessed over them, their fear turned into hate and hate into greed, they demanded for Kagaya to be handed over them. But the emperor would not give his love, so for the first time the humans made war, and the emperor would die in battle. In her grief Kagaya ran from this world, but she could not go back to heaven as it was her duty stay on this mortal world and protect it, so she plucked the magical fruit from the god tree and ate it, with this the god tree died, and Kagaya became the mother of Chakra. In her final act she gave the humans Chakra each and every one, so they may become strong enough to face their fates alone without her help. With this done she ascended to the moon. There she stays as the moon goddess mourning her beloved and remaining vigil over the world. But she would never aid the mortals again, and stood by watching as they squabbled and bickered, killing and conquering each other in their wars. And this was how the elemental world was founded, how Kagaya left the humans to the strings of fate. Eventually the humans had forgotten Kagaya, only temples and shrines remain. The world was in chaos, the people were aimless and lost, they fought and stole, lied and cheated. Fathers were murdered, mothers were raped, and their children would seek revenge. And so, the cycle of hatred began. It was in this time that the great monstrous demons, the Biju, were born from the people's hate and bloodshed. The beasts would terrorize and ravage the land. But out of them all the most feared was the great Kaiubi no Kitsune, even the other beasts feared its great power, because from a swing of just one of its nine tails would level mountains and start tsunamis. However, not long after Kagaya left the world, a man came. He was a wise and holy man, he knew the secrets of Chakra, so he created the faith of Ninshu. A belief that because humans were all came from the same source, that they were created from the god tree and blessed by Kagaya with chakra, in this they were all connected. The man became known as the sage of six paths and was the father of ninjutsu. And so, the sage lived and helped the people, teaching them the blessing of chakra. Eventually, the sage became old and it came to pass that he was nearing the end of his journey, so he took two apprentices and taught and trained them. They were Asura and his brother Indra. So, the sage of six paths ordered his apprentices to go out and teach Ninshu and give the people ninjutsu. After a time, Indra was the first to return having completed his mission first, but the sage tarried and waited for his other student, after a year Asura finally came home. But this the sage of six paths named Indra his successor of his teachings, and so Indra spread ninjutsu, and his followers would be known as ninja. Brave warriors who through their power and strength would fight to protect the people. The ninja would go through history as a force to be reckoned with, Eventually, they would become separate clans, and they would fight and war until Hashirama Senju along with Madara Echeha created the first hidden village. Hashirama would also capture and distribute the Biju so that a balance of power may bring peace. Time would pass and the village hidden the leaves would be something that none could compare. The village knew peace and prosperity for many years until one fateful night. The Kanoha was attacked by the horrible Kaiubi, no one knew why it was there or what made it to be angered, but it led a rampage of destruction. All hope was lost until the hero of the third ninja war, Minto Namaka's Aka the Yellow Flash, defeated the Kaiubi. But it would cost him his life. That is the history that everyone knows over. But they didn't know was a day later a woman, with hair as red as blood, left the village with her three children. She was aided by dear friends, an entire clan even defecting with her swearing to protect her small family, they all slipped away into the night. Never to be seen again. Chapter 1. The Bridal Party. She was not happy. Surprisingly it wasn't just because she was being shipped off to be married to someone, she had never met O that did weigh heavily on her mind too. 
She was not happy at the fact her butt fell asleep again. Her lower half was almost completely pinning and needles getting closer to all out numb. This was because they couldn't just run through the countryside, leaping along the tree branches like normal ninja, oh no. The daimyo had to insist that she be treated like a proper bride-to-be, more like sacrificial offering, and shoved in a strange metal and fiberglass monstrosity of a carriage called a limousine. Damn it. What, I wouldn't give to get out of this damn thing and stretch my legs. She thought in her usual manner internally that is. Honestly, if people knew the things she said in the privacy of her mind. Sakura Haruno had never seen such a contraption as a car, for one thing it had no horses or even pallbearers, it moved along at fairly high speeds that some ninja would have trouble matching and completely under its own power. Their escorts had to ride in vehicles much like this one called vans, or else they would be left behind. She was grateful she was used to going at such high speeds, or else she would have definitely got motion sickness, like a certain green beast was dealing with, but even so the journey still had taken several days, and she was not used to just sitting around doing nothing for so long. The vehicle honestly intrigued her, a distraction giving the pink-haired girl a welcome reprieve from her situation, she learned that it ran completely mechanically with an engine much like what was found on trains. However, it didn't use burning wood or coal to create steam or any liquid fuel-based combustion engine that she had read about, like the incredible electrical generator her father had bought for emergencies that ran on a crude oil derivative called gasoline. Whatever it ran on the ride was smooth and quitno, if only they could find a way to stop the inevitable numbness of one's rear from prolonged rides. Despite her rebellious glutes protesting at being squished from sitting too long and the added anxiety of not keeping busy, the limo as the daimyo called it, was quite comfortable. The limo had enough seating in the cushions that reminded her of sofas for like 10 people and could fit her and her five companions, oops, six actually, comfortably to the point that they practically could lay down. The eldest of the two blondes present, who just so happened to be the hokage, was in fact lounging on her side in a manner that a male would find provocative. Sakura looked to the only men, being her father and her sensei, making sure that both were not sneaking glances and behaving themselves. Her father was too busy watching the scenery whiz by the window, but she never known him to be a pervert, her sensei on the other hand was a huge one, but he was satisfied with his usual trashy harlequin romance novel. Tsunade Senju was on the side sofa that ran the length of the limo, reading reports that had been sent via summon by Sakura's senpai, who had been left behind to watch over things in the Hokage's absence. Another amazing innovation was that the limo somehow had central air like an office building or grocery store. Hai no Kuni, or the Land of Fire, was a northeastern country with four seasons, right now it was in the middle of the summer, so the air outside the limo was particularly hot, especially with all this humidity, fucking sage does that make it worse. They were traveling southeast to the coast where they would head to Nami no Kuni, or the Land of Waves, and from there to their final destination. The cool, but not cold, breeze manifested from the small vents, kept the sultry air outside at bay and the inside tempered and comfortable. Something that would not be remotely possible in the more traditional wooden carriages made of oak and or mahogany. Sakura looked around the compartment, she resided with the people that were her closest family whom she loved. To her right, reading a fashion and celebrity news magazine, was one of her childhood best friends whom she saw as a sister, and oftentimes rival, Ino Yamanaka. Correction just Ino. The platinum blonde had to leave her clan when she made the decision to join Sakura in her soon-to-be new home. The only way Ino could come along and also stay with Sakura was to give up her clan's name and swear fidelity to her best friend as her handmaiden, abdicating her right as heiress to the Yamanaka and placing herself in servitude to Sakura. Inoichi and Inamura, Ino's father and mother, was saddened, but they respected and understood her decision. Ino had already been pretty much written off by most of the village, so she would never be taken seriously if she had taken her father's place as clan head when the time came anyway. Sakura was still beyond pissed about the whole thing. Ino had well, she did something pretty stupid for a boy she had a major crush on, who just so happened to be one of Sakura's teammates, a weirdo artist named Sai, she always knew he was a major creep, and then said boy made it so that the whole village knew. Nothing happened between her and the boy in a way that couldn't be taken back, Ino let Sakura check, but no one believed her. However, the worse of it was that Sai never spoke up in her defense. She was branded a harlot by every busybody in the village, it was not that far of a stretch for most people, given that the former Yamanaka already had a reputation for being flirty and war fashionable, and revealing clothing. Sakura never believed a second that Ino had done something so scandalous as just hoping into bed with a guy, but with Ino being an heiress to a fairly famous ninja clan, she was constantly under a microscope since she was born, the likes of which Sakura mused was the reason her best friend tended to act out. So, when the incident happened and the manner it occurred, she was judged unfairly by people who had no business making an opinion in the first place, cough civilians cough. 
Sakura found the whole thing ridiculous and two-faced. Sex before marriage in her village was not uncommon although still highly frowned upon, mostly by ignorant civilians, nosy housewives and the odd spinster or old biddy with nothing better to do, but when living in a ninja village birth rates was very important. And when on mission there was no guarantee that you would be coming back, so why leave it to chance? But Kami-sama forbid anyone found out less a village of nosy busy body civilians drag you through the mud, it was almost karmic, given that gossiping was Eno's favorite pastime well, not so much anymore. Her village still practiced the art of seduction to Altho in the academy, they were only taught mild stuff like passing as a mundane unnoticeable girl with flower arranging and tea ceremonies, Eno once posed a princess. So many Kanoichi chose to give their virginity to trusted partners, this was also done in case of rape, but understandably, no one talked about that, so Sakura had no idea if it really helped, this way they at least can be deflowered on their own terms. Sakura didn't observe this practice of course, even though she had someone in mind if she did, but she didn't have to, shortly after graduation, she had the luck of catching the eye of the goddamn Hokage, the famous medic nin and one of three legendary senin, as well as the granddaughter niece of two founders and Hokage. So, she was seen as too valuable to be risked. She looked to her mistress. Once again realizing she would no longer be learning from the woman, Sakura had grown up without a mother, having died when she was a baby due to a strange illness that still popped up every now and then back home. The late matriarch of the Haika died the same way. Tsune didn't exactly act like a mother to Sakura, but people could see the woman loved her students like they were family. The god Aim had never married or dated from what Sakura saw, and Sakura along her fellow students, her two best friends and their senpai Shizune, were practically the closest thing the last senju had to children. Sakura couldn't help but feel heartbroken all over again. She loved Tsunade, she loved her home village, but she had to be given away so an alliance can be formed to avoid war. Her village Kanahagakur no Sado, also known as the village hidden in the leaves, well it was one of the five great elemental villages was in some major trouble, because they were on the brink of financial ruin. Even though most hidden villages, especially the five great nations, were the only military institution in its respective home country, they were still at the core a privatized military state and almost solely reliant on mission contracts which have been steadily dwindling as of late. The Leaf also had made a huge mistake offending the nation she was being offered to. On that thought, Sakura decided to reaffirm her mission as a political bride, the last she will ever do for Kanoha, and reading the files her Hokage, the Council of Elders, and the Council of Clan Lords, had given her. It was extremely in-depth to the point of obscene, they came in a three-inch thick binder. It not only stated the normal stuff like what was expected of her, i.e., make babies, but also some info on the mysterious Arashi no Kuni, the land of storms, her fiancé, and his family. It was just filled to the brim with the intel packets pertaining to her upcoming marriage. There was even a brief, but still very informative, report of why she was doing this. One of the elders, an arrogant and psychotic warmonger by the name of Danzo, had been caught doing dishonorable acts. Ninja by definition were warriors willing to lie, steal, and murder for payment, in other villages they still practiced seduction too. Sakura herself had done something she was ashamed of, if killing wasn't bad enough her first assassination had been a little too tough to swallow, sure the man blackmailed his business, revolves but Sakura didn't sign up to make widows raise their children alone. However, Danzo took things to extremes that even Ninja would never do, what finally caught him was a wrongful death, which led to discovering his acts of treason. This was why the village was struggling because clients were starting to avoid them. The Hidden Leaf had long-standing ties with the island nation of Arashi, Tsunade's clan the Senju, were actually related to the royal family of Yuzumaki clan. The two families having been split at some point in antiquity. In fact, her mistress and mother figure was a quarter Yuzumaki, her grandfather the famed Hashirama Senju, married her grandmother Mido under another arranged marriage with the Yuzumaki clan. When Hashirama-sama first made the hidden village system the Yuzumaki created their own village nearby, it was a small island of the coast of fire dubbed Whirlpool Country and Yuzushi Agakur no Sado, the village in the whirlpools. For some reason though Kanoha and Yuzushio had a falling out and the village was no longer active. Sakura couldn't find out why, she was never taught about it in the academy and her only source was not receptive to telling her. Tsunade had always been forthright with her, but the subject was apparently taboo, all the older woman was willing to say was that the leaf should have treated their friends better. But despite this there was still a small, like literally only two people, satellite family in Kanoha. Sakura looked to her left, opposite of Ino, to her other best friend. Karen Yuzumaki had it pretty hard growing up much like her, they were both bullied for their most hated features, Sakura for her forehead and pink hair, Karen for her bad eyesight and bright red hair, Sakura was a shy and timid girl back then, but when she saw Karen was like her, so she approached other girl and became friends, this however made their bullies double their efforts. 
One day the daughter of one of her father's clients, Little Eno, came to the rescue tossing flowers, claiming they were poisonous. The three had been the best of friends for years. Karen recently lost her mother, Kahana, the victim of the insane old warhawk, and nearly broke the poor girl. For the last three years Sakura and Eno lived with her, with her mother gone she was all alone in the house left to her. If Karen's mother hadn't died, there was a good chance that Sakura and she would have been stepsisters by now, her father and Karen's mother had been getting cozy, Karen's father had passed much like Sakura's mother, died on mission however, and they started dating. Her death was hard on all of them, it was obvious by how close they had gotten, Sakura's father had cried at the news of her death. It was obvious that he had really fallen in love with a woman, and Sakura herself would have loved to call her mom she was such a loving person. In the wake of her mother's death, Karen decided to move with them to Whirlpool, both so that she can be with family and to support her best friend, but really it was probably to get away from the village that indirectly caused Kahana's death. But losing the kind redeeded woman, in such an awful way, was still unfair even three years later. But it was also the catalyst that led to Sakura's engagement. Three years ago, during her first Chunin exam, an infamous criminal Nukenin had tricked their ally Sunagakur no Sato, village hidden in the sand, into invading alongside his own rogue village. If it had not been the timely intervention of a group of foreign ninjas that had been taking the Chunin exams the leaf would have been destroyed. They still, however, had lost a lot of ninjas and even more wounded. Baron's mother had a rare Kekai Genkai where if you bite her flesh, you would be instantly healed, Danzo captured her and brainwashed her with a stolen Sharingan, what was left of the Ichiha clan, was not happy to hear that, into using her blood linibit she had her limits, and her life force had been literally sucked out till she was dead. Danzo had tried to capture Karen too to do the same, however Karen noticed and had been worried about her mother's odd behavior and went to the Hokage. When the woman died it was clear that she had not been of her own will and foul play was called into question. When Danzo came for Karen, he was met by the matriarch and clan head of the Achiha, the mother of her teammate was able to resist his hypnotism and capture him. The Kodo-sama personally destroyed the Stalin Aibi cutting it out and smashing it underfoot, along with the old geezer's balls. And then the investigation started what they found was appalling. The man had done truly evil things, most of which was in the interest of the village, but he had no authority to enact them. His acts of treason had certainly offended the daimyo, the usually sedated ruler was beyond pissed. Apparently, he was the one who had tried to wipe out the Achiha clan when they were dealing with some pretty serious infighting, but that was thwarted when Makoto-sama deposed her husband. He also had a spy that manipulated the fire daimyo into acting favorably for his agenda, she ended up getting hers too, Sakura always hated that chubby cat torturing woman. Sakura looked to her lap, she gave her new pet Tora, a few gentle strokes along her back, and a good scratch on her unbowed ear receiving a purr, the daimyo gave the cat to the Rosette as an engagement gift, that and other obvious reasons. Anyway, it was Danzo's crimes against humanity that were the worst, like funding human experimentation, including on himself so many eyes so gross, or kidnapping children and stripping them of all emotion with straight-out torture as training. It turned out Sakura's teammate Sai, the boy who also ruined Eno's life, was a sleeper agent, unfortunately this info didn't help reverse Eno's reputation, he was placed on Sakura's team with mission to try to coax her other teammate Sasuke Chiha to Danzo's side and join his, illegally formed without permission from of the Hokage, Anbu. Unfortunately, Sai escaped right before his own execution and ran, he is now a missing nin, oh heaven help him if Sakura runs into him out in the field, he'll find out what it's like to be his precious paint. Danzo was put on trial for treason and crimes against humanity. Sakura shivered when she remembered the trial, it was more of a spectacle really, the Godin used it as a means to give her leverage in disbanding the civilian parliament, Aka the Danzo fan club, who had been gaining far too much power in what was supposed to be a ninja ruled village. The man gave Tsunade all the ammunition she needed. Danzo was in San Riving on and on about roots this and ninja are just tools that, almost pathetic really, he had allowed himself to fall deeply into the teachings of the second Hokage Tabarama Senju, to the point of fanatical zealously. Tsunade assured Sakura that her granduncle had never meant anything the Cray Cray Warhawk was interpreting. When it came to his execution Tsunade decided that, while appalling and treasonous, the man had never done anything that didn't have the village's best interest in the end. So Danzo was allowed an honorable death by Sapuku, ritual Sasitabi gutting yourself. Sakura would never forget that day as the day she watched a true shinobi to if she was honest, it was awe-inspiring, but she was still glad he was gone, the world was a safer place without him. However, the death of Kahana was still the village's biggest issue and half the reason Sakura had to leave home. Arashi's royal family had gotten word and they were furious. It turns out Karen's dear mum Kahana was actually Lady Kahana, Duchess of Nagi and sister to the Queen of Storms. How or why actual royalty was slumming it in Kanoha was a mystery. No offense to the place she was born of course, but the village was lacking on the metropolitan front. 
even though one of the big five, the Leaf had trouble progressing beyond its rural and rustic charm, they still had fucking dirt roads as the main streets. Sakura still listened to records and the radio until her father bought her a laptop as a graduation present, and she learned what CDs were. Supposedly the Storm Nation was home to some major tech and engineering companies, the limo for example, was such a product purchased by the fire daimyo, effectively starting a rapidly growing trend among nobility and royalty everywhere, this meant the tropical nation may be decades ahead of the curve in tech. Sakura wondered how Kumagakur no Sato, village hidden in the clouds, was taking that and it well would be the best guess. Cloud was as bad as Awagakur no Sato, village hidden in the stone, when it came to pride and technological advancements was something they liked to rub in other villages' faces. The hidden ninja village of Kaminari no Kuni, Land of Lightning, was known to produce some interesting things due to their research into electricity, but they were stingy, and most innovations were annexed for military use, so new stuff from them reaching other nations was sparse. Sakura went back to reading her Felesnet, noticing the concerned looks from her travel mates, even the furry one. The storm nation was large, as big as fire, consisting of a main island and a plethora of smaller islands, but only a few coastal areas were inhabited on the main island of Oyuzu, this was because it was covered entirely by lush jungle that was said to have very dangerous creatures and were mostly nature preserves. The whole nation was protected by a natural defense of various storms along the coast that was the country's namesake, there was even many whirlpools and rocky shores, according to the files whirlpools were very important to local beliefs, there was myths that some of the biggest ones were portals to supernatural planes. The land of storms were also very wealthy because of having a free market open to all foreign trade and rich natural resources, this has led to them having more allies than any other nation. The list went thusly. Nami no Kuni, Land of Waves. Sakura went there once on her first seer rank, it was really boring, just escorting this drunken old carpenter that mostly built bridges. But she got to see the ocean for the first time and learned of a local folktale about a famous Nukunin that gave his life for his apprentice in a final act of fatherly love, so heartbreaking and beautiful. The Kigakur no Sado, village hidden in the waterfall. They lived in an undisputed territory that had no real nation but seemed to do really well. But they had a bad reputation, a former leader had sent an assassin to kill the first Hokage, someone all nations respected at the time, for basically inventing the ninja system as we know it today. There was talk that Taki, which was located on Nagi Island to the north, becoming the Storm Nation's new hidden village. To what extent was unknown but many had made it clear they didn't like it, as Nagi Island had a huge gold trade. Ara no Kuni, Land of Spring, formerly Yuki no Kuni, Land of Snow. Sakura went there too. The daimyo was having trouble cleaning out remainant loyalists of her tyrannical uncle. The place was beautiful, and she couldn't believe it used to be covered in never-ending winter, or that Koyuki Kazuhana-sama was also Yuki Fujika's Haim. The famous and gorgeous actress of the Princess Gale movies. The Ino and Karen was so jealous when Sakura came back with a photo of her and the actress leader posing, blowing kisses and winking with peace signs, complete with autograph. There was one unknown. It was this very distant and powerful empire far off to the west that didn't have ninja or even use chakra. The only info that anyone had on it was that its people had strange clothing and customs, and the term knight in shining armor came from there. Rumor had it that there was one more, but there was no info about them due to uncertainty of their relationship with Arashi, the rumors were saying that they had offended the queen, and she was thinking of giving them the boot. But what was really scary was that Arashi was really chummy with two other major elemental villages as well. Apparently, they had gained an alliance with Mizu no Kuni, Land of Water, and its village Kurigakur no Sado, village hidden in the mist, which had recently stabilized. They had a really bad civil war that had been going since before Sakura was born. The other village was somewhat unsettling, the new and very young Kazakiage of the Sand apparently was very good friends with a member of the royal family, this meant that Yuzushio had the support of two of the great elemental villages. Sakura remembered Gara no Sabaku, she was terrified of him then because he was a murderous psycho, a cute psycho admittedly, magnet user almost ended her friend Lee's care errand, that was after he had already slaughtered many others into a bloody paste. During the invasion with Odo, he almost killed her how she was saved was a mystery. However, Sakura had been getting to know his older sister Tamari, she was named ambassador to the Leaf and worked with Ino's former teammate Shikamaru. Sakura met her often while working for the Hokage helping in the office, Tamari said that Gara had took a turn for the better and was healing, the next time she saw him he was defiantly changed. He even apologized to her. However, the shock of the century was Tetsu no Kuni, Land of Iron, which was not an ninja-run country because they were ruled by samurai. The news rocked the world and was causing quite a stir, the samurai of iron swore they would never involve themselves with ninja. And most of the world had ninja in one form or another. 
A samurai of iron were the last of their kind to hold rule over a country as far as she knew, they still existed and served daimyo, but ninja had become the main military force on the international stage. But ninja everywhere both feared and respected the swordsman, Sakura Sensei Kakashi, honestly admitted that he too was pretty scared of them, he had a run in with them only once, when escorting a noble to watch a competition of top swordsmen. He said there was a boy from iron there, no older than what would be considered genin, and the boy won the tournament with frightening ease. He would start and end every match with a single slash. The swords were of course blunted, but the force of the impact nearly killed a few people, after Kakashi told that story Sasu came to next team meeting carrying a practice sword, he was now a proficient swordsman, but never seemed to be satisfied. There was another rumor that the Storm Nation and all its allies were in the process of building a multinational union, something the likes the world has not ever seen before. And there was no telling how many biju that meant Rashi had at their disposal but it was quickly tipping the balance of power between all the nations. So, with Kanoha losing business and being the only one of the top five without a biju, it would be foolish not to join as well but of course, they had to let the sister of the royal clan die a horrible and painful death at the hands of a zealot. It was a catch-22. They needed the alliance to stay afloat while at the same time keep them from declaring a very costly war that Kanoha could not afford, no telling if they would win either they would get creamed for sure. It was like giving the neighbor a black eye and then ask for money. So, when such a situation presented itself there was only one thing any ninja village could rely on tradition. The marriage between Sakura and her future husband, still an alien concept to her, would be an act of good faith, much like it was between Mido and Hashirama, and their union would be seen as a symbol of peace. There might be an issue with Sakura's low birth, to put it bluntly, she was a commoner from a civilian trading clan, but Tsunade had assured the girl that her status as the slug sage's most farthest reaching apprentice and one of two inheritors of the slug contract, as well as her astounding record as a medic nin. The Rizet's cachet was more than elevated enough to marry a prince, she hoped it did, Sakura can't afford such a lethal blow to her go game. Sakura wasn't privy to the finer points of the exchange, like trade agreements, no doubt though there would be the usual resources ninja nations tended to barter. Things like jutsu and agriculture goods like crop and livestock, yeah, Sakura felt really special being as valuable as cow, there was of course the promise of aid during times of battle, and even possible exchange of forces, the deal would also open both nations to investment opportunities. That was why Sakura's father Kazashi came along, of course following his only daughter and the daughter of the second woman he had ever loved, making sure they were both safe was more important, even though this was modern times and the decision was all Sakura's, it was still traditional for the father to negotiate the terms of the betrothal and accept the dowry. And since this was a marriage between political powers that meant he was basically representing the leaf in much to the man's protests, Lady Tsunade had appointed him the official ambassador. It wasn't like he couldn't do the job, being a merchant, he pretty much did the same thing as politicians, brokering contracts and deals for his clients, making sure they were happy, and was not getting the short end of the stick, but this was of a magnitude he had never done before. He would technically still be a citizen of the leaf, but he was moving with them to be close to his little girl and do his job more effectively, so he would have to make trips back every now and then for an official report. Overall, it would be up to him to make sure Kanoha would get a favorable deal and continue to do so for the foreseeable future, no pressure. It would also be difficult for him because there was the strong possibility he would be primarily dealing with his own daughter and would need to disregard his feelings for her and think only of Kanoha's best interest. Sakura remembered what he said to her after he got the appointment from the Hokage. As long as I know you are safe and happy, that he treats you right and doesn't hurt you, then I can manage anything in the world. Sakura repressed the urge to cry, if she was gonna be a princess she can't cry. And turned the page. There in bold lettering was the name of the young man she was betrothed to marry Naruto Uzumaki, the Prince of Storms. There wasn't a current photo, just one from when he became a genin three years ago, much like herself. But she will admit he was kinda cute, a little chubby-faced, but those blue eyes were ahenously, they were breathtaking. Sakura had never seen eyes so blue, Ino had teal ones that were so bright and pretty, it seemed like she didn't even have pupils. But this guy, Prince Naruto, no offense to her best friend, but as you could just get lost in. Blonde and tan wasn't normally Sakura's type, but really not bad either, Sakura could see herself at least wanting to get to know him so long as he didn't have any glaring off-putting character flaws. His eyes though spoke volumes, Sakura was never good at reading people she's admit, but Naruto's eyes even in photo just projected an inner something. Kindness, confidence, and just that special little something that just made her feel relaxed. Sakura couldn't but smile back at the boy grinning with his bright eyes. Well, he looks like a nice enough guy at least Sakura thought. Somewhere in Kusa. The young man, just turned 16 actually, was sitting in a prison cell in Mizuki Castle. The infamous blood prison. 
Here he got quite an adukashan which was the point. It was unorthodox, but his master was an unorthodox man, but really, he did learn much. He met a few ninjas, and a lot of them were surprisingly willing to teach him some just about anything that had to do with battle. He especially learned about the world of ninja and its cruelty. It made him wonder, not for the first time, why his parents had been so insistent on him becoming a shinobi. You could assume it was just them want their boy to follow in their footsteps which also didn't make sense considering they didn't come from a ninja nation. But he had made promises and he would never break a promise. The teen's roommate, a kanoichi with white hair disguised as man, shifted and went on alert. He looked up at her in amusement it's cool Rick Chan, there with me he said, the young woman was wary but claimed down. They looked over to the shadows in the corner and out of inky blackness came three men, one was in a long coat and was wearing a helmet that masked his eyes and hair. The crest like much like the trident he was carrying. How are you doing son? The man asked. The younger male grinned a foxy grin awesome, this place got some nice digs, the food could use some work but you know he answered shrugging. The three men chuckled, it seemed certain habits never die, the man with the pole arm tossed something to the boy who deftly caught in between his fingers. It was palm-sized photo your training is complete, once your mother is able to go forward with her plans, you will be able to use the same summon as me and sensei he said, referred a towering man next to him, said man grinned smugly. And then we can train you in senjutsu in no time, but for now that will have to do for reward until we get home, not doubt the teen would want competition-sized pools worth of ramen. The young man looked at the picture, he could tell immediately it was the girl that was supposed marry, it was really important to his mother, but he didn't feel right about. For one they were forcing a girl to leave her home and family to marry a complete stranger, that being him, and he didn't really feel all that good about being forced either. Another thing was he had his heart broken enough in his life, why would this be any different? He was assured by the priestesses at temple this would be a good match, it was foreseen, and they were rarely wrong. All he had to do was agree to it, but even they knew fate could change. Still, mom can really pick them the teen thought. This girl, with pink hair like cherry blossoms and eyes green like the waves of his home, the boy was stunned that creature so pretty could exist. The woman looked on curiously, so he hand her the photo, she looked for a moment taking in the contents is this the girl you were talking about? She asked. The young man nodded, well, she's certainly pretty she handed the photo back ranged marriage is pretty safe, it wouldn't still be so popular if it wasn't, she seems nice enough just looking at her she said smiling. And who might you be? Asked a very tall man, he had a lecherous smile on and what is such a nice young lady doing in such an awful place? The woman eyes widened in shock, how did he see through disguise? The teen boy just shook his head saying, ignore him, he's just a pervert. Hey, I'm not just a pervert. Before he could say any more the teen, the man in the helmet and the other man with long red hair said, shut up. In unison. So, the giant sulked in the corner, muttering about not getting the respect her deserved and how much he missed someone. Come on son, it's time to go helmet said. The teen however shook his head no, can't, I promised I'd help Rixetsu out with her quest he said finality. The redeeded man rolled his eyes fucking gods, of course you did. The man in the helmet did like it either, he knew that his son gave his word, that even if they could get him out of the cell, the boy would just come right back, honestly, he was just too much like his mother. Alright miss. Since my son has made a promise, I guess we have to stay and see it through, so what is your mission? The helmet asked. Rixetsu looked to her companion of the last year who nodded in assurance, well, it all started 10 years ago she told the whole story, and he three men had to agree this could not be left alone, such an object as the box of ultimate bliss could ruin their own plans. The giant snorted great, I'm getting really sick of finding shit from the era of the sage that can end the world, but it looks like we won't be getting back in time to meet with Tsune and the Konoha delegation huh? It appears like that is the case the helmet agreed, his wife was either going to kill him or worse. He shivered as he remembered what she did to him when accidentally wine on his best suit, completely ruining it, he couldn't sit down for a week after that. The redeed shrugged man, I gotta get back to my club. You know how much I hate leaving that bitch alone there, she goes around acting like she owns that place. The other three males felt sweat go down their necks, the so-called was his sister, and she did own the place, as they were 50-50 partners. She was also the headlining act. Anyway, how long do you think this will take? The helmet asked, addressing the Kinoichi. Mui is still making preparations, but it will be soon, another month or so she informed. This made the redeed groan, whining about his precious club some more. The helmet nodded alright, we'll stay and monitor from the shadows, son. You just keep doing what you have been doing the boy nodded. And the men melted back into the shadows. The young teen looked at the photo again, tracing his finger on the girl's face, she really was pretty. Well, looks like we're not going to meet for a bit longer, I'm sorry and hope you can forgive me he sighed and tucked the photo somewhere safe. 
I know you're missing meeting your fiancé, and this doesn't mean much but thank you, no other ninja would be will to be so kind, Rigsetsu said gratefully. The young man smiled, almost amused saying you're welcome, but technically I'm not ninja anyway. Sakura was about to go into the next section of her files, the section that told her about her fiancé at least she would have if her binder wasn't yanked out of her hands. Sakura blinked, not sure of what happened for a second, before looking over to her right where she saw a very annoying purple wearing platinum blonde reading her files. Ino looked up feeling that she was being watched, she looked at her pink best friend with a blank innocent look what? Was her infuriating reply. What do you mean what? Give it back. Sakura screamed. Hey. Tsunade barked this thing is big, but it's not that big, so keep it down, you're making my ears hurt, the busty hokage said, sitting up and itching away a ringing sound with her pinky. Sakura was decent enough to blush in embarrassment, but she was still miffed, she took my files. She said, resembling a pouting child, the teen turned back to Ino give it back. I was reading that, and it's not for you anyway, it's classified. Not classified Tsunade corrected as she decided to take a break from her reports and get something from the mini Barrett look she was gonna need it. It's private Sakura restated. Ino rolled her eyes what the hell is so private. Ino then took a very comical serious expression and spoke in a fake masculine voice Sakura Haruno. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to marry a wealthy prince and spend the rest of your life in luxury, fame, and riches. Your mission will be completed and deemed successful when you have popped out a few mini humans. At that last instruction Sakura's father turned beet red and breathed out a curse. He also went to the mini bar. Sakura was not amused by her friend's antics, although the bespectacled Reed deeds seemed to have no problem giggling away. Come on Eno, that binder is important the Rosette said, trying to reach for it, damn Eno and her long arms. Ora jumped down out of the fray and went to sit in the empty seat now available next to Tsunade, the woman sighed and shook her head. But Eno was not done, her friend was not dealing with something, and the best way to get the cherry blossom to open up was to piss her off first. Come on forehead, what's so personal about some boring files? Unless it has the guy's size and photos of his shirtless at this Eno's eyes widened at the intriguing possibility wait. Does it? She said as she frantically flipped through the binder. After being accused of being improper Eno started having zero filter. At first, she was ashamed and really hurt, but after a while she started to get angry instead. It was her body, who the hell had the right to tell her what she could and couldn't do with it. No one. So, she just let them talk and even gave them some more to talk about. No man has ever touched her since, but if she wanted to flaunt what her mama gave her and talk about sex that was her right as woman, and Kami helped any asshole who thought she was easy. The re deed to Sakura's left adjusted her glasses and glared at her blonde best friend, after all that was her cousin, the other girl was objectifying Ino Karen warned. She didn't believe any of what was said about the former Yamanaka, any more than Sakura did she did however, wish Ino was less loud and annoying. She was interested in sex too, but she hid it better most of the time. Ino of course ignored the warning, honestly the edge queen, as the Yuzumaki had come to be called, was worse of a nag than Sakura sometimes. At least she didn't have a civilian upbringing, she loved Sakura dearly, but her prudish and vanilla ways was often a buzzkill, Karen was a good balance. Ino waved off the other girls relax, you know I'm kidding hey, Karen Watt's a popular kink in your family's homelands. Ino. Sakura yelled. Really, try defending against an entire village that your friend wasn't floozy when said friend went around talking like that. Karen sighed and lifted her glasses pinching the bridge of her nose, mumbling about dizzy blondes, she said, if I tell to you will you shut the hell up and give Sakura her binder back. Ino plopped the binder onto the pinkette's lap with a smack ow. The girl yelped. Karen shook her head, she thought for a moment well, and I'm and Manga are really popular there. Hell I would be surprised if Arashi evented the stuff. So, cosplay maybe. Sakura actually blinked at that that doesn't sound too bad she admitted, she never had the courage, but she always thought that hobby was cool, some of the outfits were so cute. But there is this urban legend that says that Shibari was evented there too. Karen said, and Sakura shrank into her seat with a squeak, hold her binder up for protection. Ino cackled in amusement. The Kashi snapped shut his book. Really girls, you're seriously putting me off my reading talking about such things like that. The silver-haired man stated. Tsunade actually paused from her drinking to regard the man you read porn she retorted frankly, disgust clear on her face and in her voice. The Kashi waved his finger to his leader, the man was lucky he was married to the Hokage's eldest pseudo-daughter, promising grandbabies were on the way, or the booze and casino-loving older woman would have used her legendary strength to rip off the cheeky Jonin's digit and shove it up his ass. Not true, I read vivid romance literature with drama, humor, and yes some strong sexual themes and situations. I'm not interested in listening to the vulgar rantings of teenagers who have no idea what sex even is, my book is far more fulfilling. 
His anecdote earned him a triple raspberry emanating from the back of the limo. The adults felt like sweating at the embarrassing sight with Kakashi thinking real mature, and these girls are supposedly gonna save the village well, we're boned. Tsunade however came to the girls' rescue oh yes, Shizun told me how fulfilling your reading as she looked at the three teen girls with a mischievous grin, she said you love your book so much that you write your own which you later test out with Rollaplay. The girls all collectively gasped, and the poor copycat grew an angry bright red blush, glaring at his faux mother-in-law, it wasn't easy being married to the apprentice of a legendary Kinoichi. Oh, my sage. What a weirdo. Ino exclaimed, starting a laughing fit between her and her girlfriends. Poor Kakashi. A short glass with what looked like cola and a cherry in it was held into his field of vision. The Haruno ambassador had read his mind, and Kakashi took the drink gratefully not caring how much alcohol was in it and fully it was a lot. Tsunade was satisfied with putting her son-in-law in his place. So, she looked at her still giggling younger apprentices, but really Sakura she said gaining said girl's attention along with her friends, you have been reading that binder like a bible since we left. Perrin, now under control, rested her hand on her friend's shoulder giving a concerned look, she adjusted her glasses and asked she's right, you've been quiet all morning, and your chakra has an uneasy flux to it. Are you okay? Karen asked, trying not to invade her friend's privacy by looking too deeply into her aura. Sakura looked to the redeed, and then to the blonde on her other side, who had a small calming smile, trying to encourage her as well, Sakura sighed it's justice this really happening. I keep trying to tell myself it is, but I just she sighed again more forcefully in exasperation. The thing with Sasuke still hurts, but I'm over him asli, it's just this is happening so fast, I don't regret agreeing to this but I'm barely keeping up. That's why you keep reading the intel Kakashi said sipping his drink, Sakura was always used to being in control the man used sigh the whole team was too rigid, if I had someone more unpredictable, then maybe we could have taken harder missions. Hopefully this will help her becoming more adaptive. Sakura's father Kazashi chuckled, you always were a study bug, even as a very little girl you always had to read and research everything, never taking anything at face value. I remember when your cousin got drunk and said snow fairies weren't real, and didn't leave presents under the gifting tree for winter solstice, he then looked to the other adults with a warm fond smile, by that solstice eve, she had a full lecture ready for the family, complete with visual aids, proving without a doubt that snow fairies were real and could in fact deliver presents. He then looked to his daughter with a bright smile, I hope you kept it all, it would be a wonderful tradition to keep going for your own children. Sakura, despite her embarrassment, had a fond nostalgic smile of her own yeah that would be great, I still have the lecture somewhere with my books, she then frowned sadly, just not the visual aids, I brought them to Shula and they were smashed in the mud, totally ruined. His ashy looked saddened, once again wishing he could have done more when his daughter was younger, but it was hard being a single father, while running an entire clan's worth of trade deals and other business. That was why he fell in love with Kahana, the woman was there for his baby girl, whenever his cherry blossom needed a woman's advice. Well, at least we didn't have to worry about anyone after that, we got them good. Ino said triumphantly. Yeah, I didn't have any problems after that Sakura said trailing off at the end, she became quiet as faces flashed in her head. Perrin and Ino looked at each other and then sighed in seeing their friends shift in mood and shaking their heads. Except Kona. The girl said in unison. Kona? Tsunade asked hearing them you mean that girl from the Ichiha clan who married Makoto's boy. The Hokage didn't notice the two men motioning in a don't say it manner, but they were too late. At the mention of her former teammate and long-time crush, marrying her old schoolmate and kinda friend, Sakura slumped in her seat completely depressed. Fucking bitch Ino commented under her breath. Perrin frowned disapprovingly at Ino that's not fair Ino, she had no choice in her marriage anymore, then Sakura did, and she is still one of my friends. She scolded. I'm sorry but excuse me if I'm a little suspicious with how easily it all went, I mean, but Ino wouldn't finish because a golden chain came out of nowhere and wrapped around her mouth effectively gagging her. M.M. MMM. Shut it you dumb blonde Karen smirked. Said blonde glared back and mumbled under the chakra conjure chain that translated as fuck you, four-eyed bitch. Sakura ignored them, too depressed. Kona was girl who just showed up one day in class, so the story goes, she was a half Ichiha who was born outside of the village, apparently, when she had unlocked her Sharingan at a young age her mother felt it was best to send her to the clan. She was nice and akin to she was not a typical Ichiha, she was actually complete opposite, she was loud and loudly foul-mouthed, always having a smirk on her face and eating dango. She was also, as Ino liked to put it, a psychotic bitch that enjoyed torturing people. She was kinda loner but sociable enough, she part of Karen's tracker team, but when she got promoted, she went to apprentice in the torture and interrogation unit. Word was she was doing well. Perrin was right, it wasn't Kona's fault, but everything that happened after graduation it just felt like her life was spiraling out of control. 
There was no joy in it, just being a ninja, a soldier. It was as if she was the earth below without a heaven above. For all the drama Sakura's school years was a simpler and more innocent time. Sakura for most of her school life, and for some time after being placed on the same team, pined after Sasuke, she'd cheer him on like the others and stare at him dreamily from a distance, always asking if he would like to go on a date and be rejected instantly each time, but Sakura never gave up hope. But it got harder to do one day when they all were about six. Sasuke's older brother, Itachi, went rogue after being accused of killing his best friend and cousin and trying to cover it up as a suicide. Itachi slipped away after killing the entire police force, no one knows what really happened that night, but it was chaos and ended with Makoto Ichiha, Sasuke's mother, executing her husband Figaku and taking over the clan. The resulting fallout would elevate the clan, Makoto's sacrifice was praised throughout the village, they would move closer to the village center and rebuild the police force alongside the Haikta. Sasuke changed forever, Itachi was very important to the young Ichiha, and the betrayal hit him hard, his betrayal would be widely accepted as the catalyst for the Ichiha massacre, as it was soon to be called. Sasuke swore a vendetta on his brother, blaming the Itachi for his pain and dishonor placed on his clan, he became broody and unsociable. He wouldn't talk to anyone, at least not politely, grunting and calling everyone annoying was all you could get most of the time, he was now the only heir and future lord of the clan. But despite all this it made Sasuke more popular and desirable, the new attitude made him mysterious which all the girls ate up. Sakura however felt sorry for him and because of this became more convicted to be his special someone. Sasuke was not going to have it however and made it clear on the day they became a team. It wasn't all bad, for a while they were just a team and then friends, Kakashi at first was a terrible teacher, but after he and Shizune started dating the Jonin medic lit a fire under the man's ass. Kakashi suggested for Sasuke to ask if his mother could teach Sakura about Jinjutsu, the woman was very nice and a great teacher, and Sakura was very suited for it. That was how Sakura met the Hokage's assistant, Shizun was impressed with Sakura's chakra control and offered to teach her when Sakura read nine medical books in one week that was when Tsunade came in. They would have a good run, they would go on missions, Sasuke and Sai would constantly bicker and fight. It was like Sai went out of his way to provoke the Ichiha. There was time Sakura couldn't be happier, and then Sasuke surprised her by asking Sakura out. It was the blissful the genin had ever felt. For all of one week. They only went on one single date, lasting all of three fucking minutes, that whole time. She never even got so much as a kiss out of it, better that way, no sense in wasting her first kiss with a heartless jerk. He did it right before the Chunin exams. She thought he was starting to love her, he never said he did, Sakura just stupidly assumed, he said that he was just seeing what was there between them, that he wasn't sure how he felt about her. When he broke up with her, he said he was confused about how he felt, but he realized after spending time with her that his feelings were just great care and admiration for a teammate and even saw her as family, because every girl loves the I love you like a sister speech that. Just when Sakura's heart couldn't break anymore, she found the announcement for Sasuke's engagement while checking her computer the very next day after they broke up. Apparently, the betrothal had been in the works since Kona came into the village, by law 16 was the age a licensed ninja could marry, but the marriage was already set in stone long before that. Sasuke had played her, he was just using her because he had cold feet and was looking for an out. She never saw him again after that until the exams, and even then, it was just about the exam and nothing else, and it felt like she was in the way. She almost died after getting swallowed by a giant snake, thankfully teams of the other rookies were nearby and got her out, but when she was inside somehow Sasuke got knocked out. After the invasion Sakura left for full apprenticeship with Tsunade and Team 4, bad numerology right there, would be officially disbanded, much to Kakashi Sensei's disappointment, he really thought he finally found team who understood teamwork and friendship. Of course, Sakura would see and train with the erotic book lover, but after getting married he just basically retired, he took a vacant seat in the clan council. Haddock wasn't really a clan, but Kakashi had garnered enough respect to be rewarded with the privilege to be a part of the discussion and have a vote. Sasuke left too for training somewhere for the next three years and had just came back in time for his wedding, which Sakura stupidly attended as his ex-teammate, Kona was so chipper and nice, fucking gloating bitch. And here she was now, doing her best trying to save the village, on her way to marry a complete stranger. Sakura always had a plan for her life, but ever since she became a ninja, it was like she couldn't have anything she really wanted. So, it's Asu Karen said, reading her like a book. There is that look to her friend with a disapproving frown Karen, you know I hate it when you read me so deeply without my permission she reminded her friend. Karen had another Yuzumaki bloodline that gave her incredible sensing abilities, she could find people more accurately than even a Haikta, faster too, and didn't even have to mold chakra like other sensor types, it just happened with a thought, although she does have trouble sometimes with it just switching on automatically. 
If she concentrated on one person she could read them kinda like how Yamanaka reads minds, but she couldn't read specific thoughts and memories, just interpret how someone feels from how the subject's chakra fluctuates. Karen had always described it as reading other people's auras. Sakura respected her friend and lived and let live, but Karen and Ino were into that mystic nature stuff, Sakura never understood it. Karen looked to one of the two people in the world she considered a sister, concern still shining behind her glasses. Her mother always said that her, Sakura and Ino were so much alike, but still complimented each other. The Yuzumaki really wanted to help her friend, so Karen held out her hand asking for permission and waited, the Rosette looked to the hand apprehensive Elibit after a moment conceded and took the offering. Karen smiled and began instructing now, you know what to do, so just close your eyes and relax, just let your emotions fill you, swirl around inside of you, and hold nothing back Karen, then look to her other friend Eno, why don't you help? Eno struggled a bit, she really wanted to help, but as it was, she didn't trust her ability because she didn't have it anymore. Part of the deal of her removal from the Yamanaka was that her father, having no choice in the matter because of clan laws, had to go into her mind and erase the clan's secret jutsus. Technically the Yamanaka techniques were categorized as a teachable bloodline, same with the Akamichi and the Nara, anyone could theoretically learn them, but only that clan had the slightly above average genetic traits to use the Jutsus. Yamanaka had a unique enough brain configuration to use the Jutsus effective alien above all safely. However, her parents didn't want to completely declaw their only daughter though, so her father removed all the necessary information needed for the Jutsu, such as hand seals, how to mix her chakra, and what to do once the technique was activated. But he left a lot of her psychic training from when she was growing up, like meditation techniques, and how to access different parts of her brain needed for psychic jutsus, and how to enter her inner psyche, and create various mental landscapes like a memory palace or just a neutral mindscape for her to escape and relax. With this she can train and hopefully create her own jutsus, it wasn't uncommon, Jinjutsu often used reaching into an opponent's mind so that the illusion could have a personal touch unique to the one it was casted on. Shizun said that her uncle Dan had a technique that was similar to the mind-body switch technique though, because of him not being a Yamanaka, his inability resulted in the creation of a highly lethal assassination technique. Shizun was kind enough to give the ex-Yamanaka the only scroll with all his notes and the finished jutsu, but Ino as of yet hasn't felt comfortable enough to learn it. And that was why she was so reluctant. She was scared of hurting herself or even worse her friends, she didn't want to accidentally shred Sakura's mind like a blender, worst case the girl would become a vegetable, and best case she would revert to a younger mincid. As funny as seeing a nearly grown woman acting like a kindergartner, Ino didn't want it to be her friend, and certainly didn't want to be the one responsible. Sakura saw Ino's hesitation it's okay Ino, you don't have to if you don't feel comfortable, but I know you can do it. I trust you she said offering her hand. Ino looked to her hand and then back to her two best friends, they were smiling encouragingly to her urging for her to try, the former Yamanaka was touched by their faith in her. Ino mulled it over for a moment longer and then took Sakura's hand. Karen smiled more brightly nodding satisfied, her friend smiling back. Now Karen began as Sakura focuses on her thoughts her chakra flow will be affected, you don't have my kekai genkai, but you are still a sensor type. So, just mold your chakra to start sensing while also connecting to Sakura's chakra system through your hands. Don't go through it to her mind, just watch it feel it and interpret as best you can. Ino did as she was told taking Sakura's offered hand while placing her free hand in a one-handed half-ram seal and touched Sakura's chakra with her own. As far as she could tell it was working, Ino could feel her chakra like she was sticking her hand into a stream, the flow felt like it was having trouble deciding what speed it should go it was restless. Ino deduced that what she was feeling was Sakura's anxiety of her upcoming marriage. Karen began her own preparation, unlike other bloodlines hers wasn't like flexing a muscle, rather it was relaxing and allowing her ability to take control letting it loose. When she does though the white noise from all the sources can be staggering even for her, it would be so easy to just lose herself to flow of all things, it was not as ingen painful. It was like have loud speaker right next to your head. Karen sorted out everything until she was able to focus on just those in the limo, and then finally herself, Sakura and Ino. Lady Tsunade, if you would say something please Karen murmured, too focused to really speak up. Okay about what? The Hokage asked. Anything, talk to Sakura about the marriage and get her to think about it more, ask questions if you like. Tsunade thought for a moment and got an idea, she walked over to the girls as best she could, crouching while she moved under the very low roof of their vehicle. Damn, haven't been like this since my team and I were in the war and had to sneak through those vents, sage my hips are killing me, she mentally grumbled until she realized what she was thinking. I'm not old, I am not old, I am not fucking old. Was her thoughtful chant. 
Tsunade got far enough so that she can lean over and grab Sakura's binder, continuing to deny in her brain that she was not old, while her body screamed in agony, saying she was, once she had the files, she made it back to her seat slumping in the cushion, making Tora bounce with her, but the cat didn't seem to mind. The Hokage opened the binder and started read a specific section. Bakashi, Kizashi, and Tora all looked on in fascination. Naruto Uzumaki, second son of Her Majesty Queen Kashina Uzumaki-sama and Prince of the Land of Storms. He only just became Chunin rank recently, but that hasn't stopped him from doing some pretty serious missions, just as a genin he has done at least 12 B ranks, 8 A rank missions, and there's even a couple S ranks all within a year. At that Kakashi whistled impressed. Perrin and Ino giggled at the feeling of their friend's chakra. Hidden village girls, whether clan or civilian, are basically bred to get giddy at the idea of a strong shinobi taking them as a wife. Thor was purring, somehow able to know her mistress was pleased, so she was adequately satisfied too. Bizashi saw the small blush on his little girl's face and had a knowing smilame but little too knowing, he looked to his hokage and gave a conspiratorial wink in which the busty blonde gave one back. Yeah, but since he has become Chunin there is a blank period, he has been off training and is due back any day now in expectation of our arrival. He is extremely popular, both as a ninja and of his own charm, the people have fallen for him, and not just because he is the queen's heir to be the next clan head. But also, because he has a natural charisma that makes him a person of the people. Sakura caught the part of her fiancé being the queen's heir, so does that mean when we are Mariatam going to be the next queen? Sakura asked, her green eyes still closed listening intently but if they were open, they would have stars in them. Ino grinned when she felt Sakura's chakra, the feeling reminded her of a puppy about to get a treat, happily jumping around with energy. Oh ho, she likes that she informed. Yeah, she does care and agreed her own smile in place. Tsunade chuckled now, maybe. The clan head and the ruler on the throne are actually two different people, sometimes the queen will do both jobs if there isn't another suitable candidate, but the clan head is always a member of the royal house and usually one of the queen's own children. The point of the clan head is for the royal family to sit in council to the queen with other clan heads throughout the country as equals. The prince is actually one of four children with Naruto being the second born like I said. Naruto has a twin sister named Naruko, the land of storms is a matriarchy, so she would be succeeding her mother. Men can hold various different offices, for example Naruto's father is the Gunjaikage, a title given much like any other cage, they act as the military leader. I have to pay homage to the fire daimyo, but I have complete responsibility and authority over my forces, the gun jikage is a servant to the queen and will keep her advised, and she will either continue to delegate her authority or give him her orders if she feels he needs to intervene. Anyone can take that role, man or woman, as long as they are loyal to the queen and a proven warrior. But the one who gets to wear the vortex crown is always a woman, an ancient tradition that has never been broken, so Naruko is the next in line. Tsunade then frowned and her voice became contemplative and somewhat saddened, but the reason I say maybe is because the princess had an accident about three years ago. It has left her body very weak and she can no longer use her chakra without causing her great pain and worsening her illness, this has affected her duties and she has officially been retired from the forces. One of the requirements to be queen is having served as a kanoichi and be in fit condition, ready to still act in battle so she can lead her armies to war if the need arises. Plus, there is many ceremonies that the queen must preside over, complex rituals that require her to push herself to her limits. So, there is a chance that the queen is looking for someone to just do those ceremonies and act as figurehead, while her son succeeds under the table and does all the real work. Wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Still, not a bad deal, get all the pageantry in front of a queen, but none of the work Akashi commented. You would think so Tsunade retorted being a figurehead has its own responsibilities, you are the face of the entire nation and must have extensive knowledge of Arashi's history and traditions, as well as nearly all world leaders and impeccable diplomacy skills too. Basically, the biggest most powerful ambassador you can think of. You're scaring Sakura Karen and Ino said at once. Oh, sorry the Hokage said sheepishly and then continued as for the rituals I actually got to see some of those ceremonies when I was a little girl, remember my grandmother was a pure blood Yuzumaki, so my family went to Arashi's old hidden village whirlpool when it was still around quite often. We went for anything from seasonal festivals to religious holidays. Let me tell you they are no joke. No one noticed Tsunade made pain twitch as she was once again reminded of the hidden village, she would visit her cousins with her grandmother and brother, Whirlpool was such a beautiful placino, it's a grave site filled with shrines to the dead. As Ashi spoke up fair warning, the people of the Storm Nation and especially the royal Yuzumaki, they all love to party, and it is not for the faint of heart he said with a big grin. Ha. 
Very true, but I trained her well Tsune barked to remember something more pleasant about her trips to Whirlpool. Well the ceremonies are beautiful and mesmerizing, they can be quite intricate, Yuzumaki are very steeped in mysticism and the supernatural, it's why they are masters of Hyunjutsu, as it was based on spirit warding talismans priests use. There are rituals that could take anywhere from a few hours to a few days. The ceremony to bring in the new year takes exactly 24 hours, and at the end the queen and priestesses usually needs medical attention. I'm not sure if they still do this, but from what I remember a lot of the Yuzumaki ceremonies require blood sacrifice. BC's rituals are ancient and sacred, impiety is not a crime, but is still a serious taboo, so you might be required to convert Sakura. Sakura scrunched up her face showing her confusion to what? She asked. The Temple of the Infinite Spiral, or simply the Temple Karen said, sounding clearer now that she had a good rhythm going and didn't have to concentrate as much it's really old, as old as Ninshu almost my mother said. It was based on another belief system no one remembers, I think the name was lost through the ages, but at the time one who founded the temple felt the other belief was unholy or something. My mom taught me the basics and we observed it, I won't bore you with it right now, I'm sure you'll get to learn about it soon enough. And yes, you will have to convert, the royal family is the head house of all the clans and must go to temple regularly as an example to the rest of the clan and the nation. Ah yes, going to temple Tsunade's side fondly grandmother was very strict about us following it. She would make us go to the shrine grandfather commissioned for her on the outskirts of the village every Sunday without fail and make us pray and say the mantras of forgiveness and blessing for hours. She shook her head nostalgically, she really should have that old shack repaired just for her grandmother's sake. It's honestly just something they came up with because they didn't like how ninja were becoming so focused on battle she then snorted in amusement, leave it to an Yuzumaki to look at all the options and make up their own anyway. But still, I believe it and it's not a bad way to live, confession is a real gas, but you'll learn about that later. Well, Sakura began I guess I can manage, I'm not really religious, but I am open-minded, can't be worse than what my relatives believes in. The pink-haired girl's eyes were still closed, so she didn't catch the disapproving glare from her father. At least tell me who or what I'll be worshipping Karen. She asked. The pen's Karen shrugged, not feeling comfortable with telling her friend, Karen wasn't very religious either, and she didn't think Sakura was a bigot. But the concept of deities for her faith was antiquated. Depends on what? Sakura pressed. Depends on what you're looking for Tsunade said deciding it was better to rip off the proverbial bandage spiral worshippers are pagans. And not like Shinto or Buddhism, real honest to the gods tribal occult worship. She finished nonchalantly sipping another drink. What? Oh. Uh, I mean, wow you don't see that anymore. Didn't think people still did that she admitted. I'm sorry, I'm sure it helps a lot of people and makes sense to them. She apologized. It does Karen said curtly but not offended I may not be as devout as my kin, but I still believe in it, it's comforting. Karen then rubbed her friend's hand soothingly, but it's fine, I forgive you. However, if my aunt really does want to make you out as some substitute queen, you'll have to follow and live the faith every day and raise your children under the temple. And I should tell you my cousins are followers, but I'm not sure how much, but Aunt Kashina though is very faithful and she believes without question. So, keep outbursts like that under control and don't get into any heated theology arguments. Sakura got scared the more she thought about it, she was not only expected to convert to paganism, but also raise her children to believe. And what was that about blood sacrifice? Images kept flying through her head. Of little boys and girls watching barbarian women drenched in the blood of a freshly sacrificed animals as they danced around a bonfire naked herself among them. Ino soothed her friend as well easy girl, it probably isn't that bad, and don't worry about the queen replacement thing. I'm sure they'll go through all their options before having to pick you. Oh, don't be like that, you know I don't think you're not worth first pick. She said, feeling that Sakura felt insulted. But Ino is right Karen interjected beside myself there are two cousins in the main royal house under my uncle Nagato, the queen's cousin. His daughter, my cousin Teaya, would most likely get the crown because a, she's female, b, she's the eldest of all of us royalty kids, c, she is a strong high-level Kanoichi, and d, unlike Naruko she's pure blood and has the Yuzumaki signature red hair. Sakura was surprised at that weight, so Naruto and his sister are half Yuzumaki. And what's so important about their hair? And you said Naruto is the second born and his sister is his twin, so what about the eldest? Why can't they succeed? Sakura asked in succession. Whoa, slow down forehead Ino said, your chakra is making my head spin. Kazashi chuckled thinking yup. Always my little study bug. Kakashi smiled with his lone eye, showing his amusement, and Toramute enjoying the show. Perrin opened one eye to look at the blonde let go then, you're probably needing a break, I'll take it from here. 
she told Eno and closed her eye again so that she wouldn't accidentally lose concentration, and you did a really good job, I think with more training and exploring, we might be able to find you a new jutsu that rivals your old clans. Thanks Eno said rubbing her temples, I'm not sure about it being that good, but this gives me hope. She admitted. She went over to the mini bar for a snack, feeling nostalgic she grabbed a personal sized bag of barbecue chips. As for your question Sakura, I'll answer them in order. Tsunade told her yes, Naruto is a half-blood, and so is his siblings, his father isn't from the royal clan, but he from prominent clan in the Storm Nation, you'll know more when you meet him. As for the hair it is a great sense of pride for the Uzumaki, like a lot of other religions, the color red represents fortune, blood, sacrifice, and passion, all of which are sacred themes in the Uzumaki belief system. Although orange is the color of the royal house for some reason. So, whatever you do, do not disrespect it. The Uzumaki have been known to be quite violent sometimes when someone insults the color of their hair, it's as bad as calling an Akamichi fat. Ino choked on her chips, that was pretty bad, and she should know. She grew up around the Akamichi clan. Geez all that for just a color. She coughed out. Actually Tsunade began you are gonna have to change your wardrobe there Ino. She informed with a teasing grin. Uh, why? The purple wearing teen asked. Purple represents poison, illness, and an unjust end in other words it means death. Karen informed a little too happily. Ino glared at her friend then why the hell do you wear it? She barked referring to the Reteed's own light lavender top. She instantly regraded her words when she saw Karen's body language flinch. Lighter shades are used for funeral sets worn by mourners Tsunade gently informed. Still saddened by Kahana's death and feeling guilty of not stopping Danzo sooner. The Senju and Yuzumaki were family after all. The sorry the younger blonde apologized getting the hint. It's fine Karen said shaking her head once we get to Arashi's capital and I can finally do a proper Yuzumaki burial, then maybe I'll finally be able to move on maybe. She said, not sounding too convinced. She then felt Sakura's chakra why do you feel guilty? It wasn't your fault. Oh. I was just realizing that I'm worrying about stupid things, I mean you're still mourning your mom. It just makes me feel petty and selfish Sakura replied in apology. Don't be, you have every right to feel that way, mum barely remembered the homeland it had been so long for her. Well you, you have to learn to love a complete stranger, but I promise you prince or not, Naruto is a really great guy. And I'm sure you will fit right in the royal court. Karen said oh. And credit where it's due, Naruto is super cute. Sakura smiled with her eyes still closed she giggled oh really. She said. But then her curiosity got the best of her so what about the eldest sibling? She asked. She noticed Karen's hand got tighter when she asked that. Cousin Menma the Redeed sighed sadly. Tsunade sighed as well the eldest son, Prince Menma, is dead. He died at the unfortunate age of 16 three years ago, I'm not sure of what happened, but I always assumed it had something to do with Naruko's accident. The most I know is what I know from when he was little in these files. He was a very serious boy, rarely smiled, but he was proud of what he was and where he came from, graciously of course. Truth be told he was actually in line take the role of clan head, meaning whoever he married would have been queen. I honestly never met him Karen spoke up again, the few times I met Naruto and Naruko he wasn't there, and never writing to us before or after that, whoever did would give a little sentence or two saying he sent his regards. So, I really don't know that much about him besides what his brother and sister told me. But from what they told me he tended to be a bit mean and cold, but he loved his family and friends, he called himself a protector, and strived to be the strongest in his country. Karen said. Tsunade nodded yes, and by the time he died he had achieved that goal in spades. He had a career similar to Itachi Ichiha and Kakashi here, gradating at a young age, and by the time you became Genin he was already Jonin. Probably why you never met him Karen. While Naruto and his sister were at the Chunin exams he was doing his duties back home. Sakura got what her master was saying and was very surprised wait. You mean the guy I'm supposed to marry was in Konoha? And took the same exam I did? She asked stunned. Well yeah Karen giggled, finding her surprised or comical don't you remember? I had family over at that time and couldn't hang out much before the exams. You even met cousin Naruko she asked. Ino's eyes widened that's you're the guy, that little blonde goofball you're telling me he is a prince. She exclaimed. You met him? Sakura asked, her eyes opening for the first time to look at her friend in shock, and what do you mean goofball? Ino felt really awkward. Oh, she had info about her best friend's new fiancé alright, it wasn't all bad but well, there was stuff she wasn't sure how her friend would take. But she would never lie to someone she saw as sister, and now Sakura was her mistress to whom she served, so she told the truth. Well Karen was showing them around the village, and so Ino went into her story. Chapter 3. The Uzumaki Twins. Three years ago, a little before the Chunin exams. 
Ino was tending the flower shop bored out of her mind, she made the mistake of trying to get out of even more boring and hard training her father was giving her for the Chunin exams, as a result he said that if she didn't want to train, then she had the time to look after the shop and give her mother a break. Finally, there was a bing bong sound that signaled someone walked in activating the new electronic bell, the entrance to the shop was an open doorway, and more than once they had lost a sale because someone was in the back and the customer felt ignored, it was a weird little device that used an invisible beam of light of all things like a trip wire. Welcome to Yamanaka Flower Shop. My name is Eno, how can I help you today? The platinum blonde said chipperly with practiced ease and an award-winning smile, as much as she hated being alone in the shop sometimes, she loved serving the customers, it was very fulfilling. She was greeted back with a giggle wow, you're right cousin, she is peppy came a girl's voice. Yeah, but I like her, she seems nice responded a boy's voice. Hey Eno. That voice however Eno recognized. Eno really looked at her guests and realized that her best friend Karen was standing with two blondes. It was a boy and girl about her age, and they had to be twins, they were nearly identical. Karen was in her usual ninja outfit of a two-piece fishnet armor bodysuit that covered her from her neck to her ankles, a dark charcoal miniskirt, a dull green short sleeve shirt with a brown decorative bar across her chest, and the usual accoutrement of her official leaf hit I ate, black sandals, and her cute glasses with the chocolate-colored frames. You know? I have someone for you to meet, well two of them, but anyway these are my cousins. She said gesturing to the boy and girl. This is my cousin Naruko she said introducing the girl first. She was very pretty, so much so Ino actually blushed despite herself. She had a heart-shaped face, and Ino noticed strange markings on her cheeks, they were thin dark lines, three on each cheek. They looked cute, but the flower girl couldn't decipher what they were for maybe she just really liked cats. Her bright goldenrod blonde hair was in two pigtails high on either side of her crown and went on till they touched her rear, the hairstyle reminded Ino of this really popular magical girl in I'm that she used to watch when she was little, the style worked for her and amplified her cute and innocent look. The girl had big eyes of the most magnificent blue Eno had ever seen, Eno couldn't decide which blue gemstone they reminded her of, just when she thought they were like an aquamarine the light would shift and they would be darker almost like a sapphire. Eno did get jealous looking at the girl's body, the girl had a figure that made the Amanaka a little pissed off at the unfairness of it all. Even though she had to be the same age as her, she was already developing an hergless figure. Widening hips, toned tanned legs, a plump butt, and was her boobs bigger than hers, Eno glanced at her own body and for once regretted all her diets, she was more developed than a lot of girls in the village, but now she was realizing why her mother and aunties kept saying she was too skinny. The girl, Naruko, was wearing a bright orange number with blue accents, normally Eno would think the color was an eyesore but for some reason it suited her sun tanned skin, so it passed Eno's sniff test and she honestly admitted it ensemble combined with her bright hair and eyes, gave a certain cheeriness. Like a beam of sunshine given life. She had on a crop jacket, showing her cute belly button and flat tummy, zipped all the way up, making it more fitted but not skin tight, but the sleeves were still loose. The shoulders were a soft baby blue and the collar and cuffs were white with padding. She had on a matching orange miniskirt much like Karen's, she even had the same armored tights and blue sandals matching her shoulders. Eno noticed the headband, she had to take a second glance because she almost thought it was the leaf sigil, it was the normal navy blue cloth that her village used, but the symbol was three spirals flowing into each other seamlessly. Hum the Amanaka girl thought never seen that one before, it reminds me of the crest on the back of Jonin Vest, I wonder what village it's from. Eno took all of two seconds to size the other girl up, after all she was a fashion pro and could pick out the next hot trend with just a glance in any boutique, and overall Eno thought the girl looked good and had good taste. But it was her kind smile that made Ino relax around the foreign Kanoichi, she couldn't place it, but something made her instantly like this Naruko girl, and she was Karen's cousin, so that was good enough for Ino. Ino smiled brightly and offered her hand politely hi. I'm Ino of the Yamanaka clan, nice to meet you. She greeted. But Naruko surprised the shop girl, she giggled giddily and took her fellow blonde into her arms and squeezed real tight, lifting her cousin's friend up high in the air, which was saying something because Naruko was quite a bit shorter than Ino. Aw, oh, come on don't be like that. Any friend of my cousin is a friend of mine. Karen Chan has told me all about you in her letters. I feel like I know you already. She exclaimed, extremely happy that she was making a new friend. Eno was stunned, and not just because a complete stranger was hugging her, this girl was a monster. Her strength was insane. Eno was struggling to breath, and her back made a popping sound when the other girl gave a firmer squeeze. But once again Naruko's sweet face tugged at Ino's heart and she couldn't bring herself to be cross with the girl, that happy grin could make a mountain swoon, so Ino just patted the girl's back and strained to smile. Yeah, sounds good Ino said using the last of her air. 
Garuko-chan the boy side put the girl down before she passes out like the others. He gently instructed with a small ace of amusement. Oops. Naruko said dropping Ino on her butt sorry, I'm a hugger she said to the gasping girl on the shop floor. Ino was able to get back her precious air and stood up no, no, it's fine. It's a truly refreshing she said, also thinking in a jump off a cliff, near death kind away. Perrin giggled well now that you met cousin Naruko, this is her brother Naruto she said, gesturing to the boy. Ino looked at him, and her first thought instantly was wow, cutie. And indeed, he was but in a much rougher way than his sister. His face still rounded with baby fat, but you could tell there was masculine angles underneath, he had the same blue eyes as his sister, but his had this alluring sharpness of confidence in them. Like he didn't have a single doubt in his mind. He also had the same whisker-like marks on his cheeks, so Ino was now theorizing it was a family thing, but then again Karen didn't have any, did you have to earn them or something? While his sister's beautiful smile was kind and calming, Naruto's handsome crooked mug was mischievous and energetic, and Ino felt herself feeling revived just by looking at it. Like she just had three cups of really strong black tea with ginseng, it was exciting and made her tingle a little. His own golden locks was much shaggier and spikier than his sister's smooth silky hair, making Ino feel a rebellious troublemaker vibe from him, but the warmth she felt from his gaze didn't make her feel threatened. Ino pegged him as a bad boy that visits his grandmother every day. A lot of girls fantasy guy and now Ino was one of them. He wore an outfit almost identical to his sister, but far looser making it baggier, denoting that he placed comfort and function over style. Ino could respect that, to her it meant that he was a hard worker, meaning he was a reliable young man, the safe guy a lot of women would say. But still fun as her earlier observation suggested. The blue on his shoulders and sandals was darker. An attempt at separating his masculinity from his sister no doubt, but not off-putting. And his pants stopped just about an inch above his sandals on the lower half of his shins. Once again Ino got a feel for her guest in seconds. He was relaxed but ready for action. She also got a pretty goofy vibe by the way he stood, with arms relaxing over his shoulders and his hands behind his head grinning away, so maybe a joker type. Honestly Ino was having trouble placing him, just when she made up her mind his posture would shift and suggest something completely different. He was just sound predictable. She decided to test him a bit with some good old-fashioned flirty teasing. Ino opened her arms and gave him an innocent batting of her eyes well, are you a hugger too? She playfully invited. To her enjoyment she got an adorable blush from him, but surprisingly too he didn't back away, he rubbed the back his neck with an even bigger grin. It was honestly refreshing to Eno, she never got a boy to give such a positive response before, she was more used to coldness, lazy boredom, or cowardly stuttering. To the Yamanaka's clear surprise Naruto opened up his own arms in return well, I mean might as well, it's good diplomacy Dadabeo. Hugging a pretty girl won't cause any wars, right? He said cheekily. Ino was blown away, not only had he withstood her charms, but he gave it to her right back with his own. And what a charmer he is, that little verbal tick is kinda cute too she thought. Deciding that he deserved a reward she went in it because he successfully charmed her, and she wasn't trying to feel what it was like to have his body pressed against hers. Why did her face feel so hot? Ino and Naruto hugged and Ino had to suppress a sigh of delight. It just felt so good in such surprising ways. For one, Naruto being a little shorter than her was actually fun, yet he was tall enough that his face wasn't in her chest, and he didn't lean it down, so it would bebb it, then again was she really against it if he did. Her arms were wrapped around his neck and shoulders, with his wrapped around her waist, and to her appreciation, he didn't try to head south to cop a feel. But again, would she really be all that mad if he did? But it was what she felt underneath his clothes that made her a bit squidgy, Ino believed was the term. The boy was hiding a seriously hard bod in those baggy ninja clothes. Despite his smaller size he had some nice broad shoulders, and she was certain rippling back muscles. His front was just as firm and she swore to Kami, all the Kai, and the Sage of Six Paths, that she could feel pecs and abs against her. Ino's hands kept feeling around trying to get a good image when it gripped something hard and round to things. Whatever they were it felt like a big lumps of steel in her hands. Ino was so busy, with her busy hands, she didn't notice that she had just grabbed Naruto's butt, drawing an adorable squeak from the boy. Naruko gasped wide-eyed, then covered her mouth in shock. And Karen smacked her face into both her hands with a loud slap. Naruto cleared his throat um, you know. He said getting his fellow blonde's attention. Um she hummed with a smile on her face, eyes closed in contentment, nuzzling her cheek into his neck. Uh Naruto tried to get out your hands, oh uh, wealth it's my ass he finally got out. It was exactly 10 long second for this information to register in her brain. But when it did her eyes flew open, she gave another experimental squeeze, and indeed it felt like his buttocus really nice hard butt. Ino let go and shot away from him like he was made of fire, squeaking out a loud eep. Ino looked at him in horror and embarrassment. 
I, 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 she stammered, did she seriously just grope Karen's cousin? Karen's foreign cousin Okami. I'm gonna be the slutty girl other villages gossip about. She would have continued if the boy hadn't saved her from her own thoughts. Naruto, although blushing hard, didn't seem mad. But then again what healthy preteen boy would be? Ah uh, he tried it's fine Eno. He then chuckled and got his cheeky grin back man, if I knew leaf girls were so friendly, I would have visited sooner he teasingly joked. Eno snapped out of her stuttering and did a really angry pout, she looked like a red-faced kitten that was denied its saucer of cream, d don't get any ideas buddy, I'm not that kind of g girl Eno said angrily. Naruto put up his hands placating her hey, you're the one who groped me he teased, clearly having too much fun with the girl who was stammering again at his jokes. Suddenly Naruto was knocked in the back of the head, launching him face first into the hard tile floor with great force, at the cry of hentai baka. Sounding in the air. Naruko had come to her new friend's rescue, if she was mad at Ino for feeling up her brother, it was overridden by her anger at her perverted twin stupid teasing. Leave Ino-chan alone and I better not hear another stupid word out of you, or you're gonna get it Dadabara. She screamed, not able to keep back her own personal verbal tick. Naruto groaned, it was possible his nose was broken, I was only joking, you're so mean Naruko-chan he whined. Naruko just huffed not giving in to his pitiful moaning and Ikibaka, gods you are so annoying. Just then there was the bing bong sound again. Eno. We're home. Came the voice of Eno's father. In walked the owners of the shop and the heads of the Yamanaka clan, Inoichi and his wife Inamura. The clan lord was a tall man with sandy light blonde hair and a shaggier high ponytail than his daughter, the man wore a typical jonin uniform and red sleeveless Hayori, he had a hard face, but didn't show hate or anger, but in fact was cheery and smiling, a quiet intensity in his baby blue eyes. Ino looked just like her mother, save for the fact she got her eyes from her father, Inamura was a stunning beauty in purple. Her dress was modest but clung to her every curve which were quite ample, her platinum blonde hair was done up in an elegant bun with two golden hairpins. She had an alluring face that could entice or freeze cold given her mood. Inoichi and Inamura walked into the shop but stopped when they saw their guests. Inoichi sighed when he saw his daughter goofing off instead of minding the sterilso, completely ignoring him without so much as a hello. You know, when I said watch the shop I didn't mean hang out with your friends he said. He saw a twitching boy bleeding on his nice clean floor and I told you no boys. At the very least have Shikamaru and Choji here too, uh, to be fair yeah. He stumbled when his wife glared at him to shut up. Inamura saw one of Eno's best friends and smiled at the girl, ah Karen Chan, how are you dear? She asked. Karen bowed to the older woman I'm doing well ma'am. And your mother? It's been some time since I last saw her the Yamanaka matriarch asked politely. Oh, you know, there is always work on the cryptanalysis team the girl nonchalantly waved off. Ah, I hope she is getting enough sunlight. People and flowers are a lot alike you know, they both need lots of sunshine. Inamura then got a sly demure smile, maybe it's time she started thinking about dating again, get a boyfriend maybe, hmm. The girl's nervous wedding was all the woman needed to confirm something. Boyfriend. Eno said like the word rang a bell, she looked up placing her finger to her chin trying to remember. She then gasped boyfriend. She exclaimed, oh my kami. Karen did you hear? She asked excitedly. The redeed sighed in annoyance no Eno, I'm not a gossip like you, I like to respect the privacy of others. She said adjusting her glasses. Well, you'll want to hear about this, guess who broke up with who? The blonde said with urgency. Karen sighed again rubbing her suddenly very tired eyes under her glasses, while her cousin stood to the side and watched with interest but completely ignoring the young male who was still on the floor groaning in pain. Alright the Yuzumaki gave in so who is it? I know Shizune sensei didn't break up with Kakashi sensei, because I would have heard about it woman treats us like we're her own personal group therapy. She huffed out exasperated crossing her arms she's been threatening to do it for a month, either make him get rid of the porn and buy him a watch, or just dump him already. No, nope, but you're so telling me more later Ino said. Perrin rolled her eyes and guessed again, I don't know Kurunai sensei finally broke up with Asuma sensei. Honestly, I saw that one coming, but I respect her for it, she honestly could do better than some chain smoker who thinks he looks so cool with that macho cowboy crap. Okay one, up yours that's my sensei, he's actually a sweet guy that needs to quit his disgusting habit, but still really sweet. Secondly, no. Ino retorted. I certainly can think of worse Inamura mumbled, right behind her there was green blur with a bad bowl cut, it whizzed by the entryway like a fox chasing a rabbit. The woman didn't see, but she shivered as if she could sense something disturbing. Inoichi was just staring at the boy on his floor, making sure he didn't have a lawsuit on his hands. Ino, I don't have all day the glasses wearing girl growled. 
Pine, you're no fun Eno said waving her hand in a flippant manner, but then she got Suryasa furious fire in her baby blues, the promise to painful death, Sasuke broke up with Sakura she said, if her words were any colder the flower shop would have turned into an ice cream parlor. What? Karen screeched. Yep, it was just yesterday Eno informed. She then went over to the counter and grabbed today's paper, tossing it to Karen read today's society column, you can't miss it it's the only story she said with disdain. Karen did as instruct and read out loud today the noble Ichiha clan has made an announcement that brings great joy to the whole village, their honorable son Sasuke was sweet high goddess it just goes on, blah blah blah, let's all kiss Sasuke's ass. Okay here we go, and today they officially announce his engagement oh, you have to be fucking kidding me. Wait. Kona as in my teammate Kona. The spectacled girl couldn't believe it, but there it was it was plain as day, a picture of Sasuke and Kona posing like a real couple. The parents decided to let the language slide, they already heard about the announcement, and both knew there was going to be hell to pay for the Ichiha boy, if he ever had the misfortune of running into their daughter and her redeeded best friend. Inamura felt bad for Sakura, the girl was so pitiful when she was younger, being bullied all the time and growing up without a mother. And even she felt a little bit of righteous female anger, the boy really was like his father in so many bad ways. There was a lot of her friend Makoto too thankfully, he used to be such a happy and sweet little boy before all the misfortune, hopefully he'll grow out of it. The Epino said with a pop Sasuke has agreed to an arranged Mariah Jet Okona. Did you know about this? You are on the same team. Iridid shook her head no none whatsoever, then again I can't say I was looking out for it, she's a nut with a snake fetish, and Sasuke is well, Sasuke. But they did hang out training and stuff. Hell, as far as I know she was the only girl he ever talked to aside from Sakura. Karen then felt dread in the pit of her stomach, does she know about this? Asked. Ino sighed depressively, you know how this village is, it's only a matter of time. That was the official public announcement from the clan, came out just this morning, so it's around at least the council seated clans by now. There's no hope of getting ahead of this, so as you and I both know she's locked in her room listening to the most depressing songs she can find on that computer of hers. Ino shook her head, crossing her arms and leaning against the shop counter, it's her hamster dying all over again. Poor Mr. Fluffy Butt, if he had only stayed in his kaja, would have been able to avoid Sakura's father vacuuming. Perrin looked at the article with a frown, Kona was actually not that bad of a free and a bit crazy, but a decent enough person, they hung out outside of training and had a good relationship. They had a lot in common, Kona never knew father much like Karen, they also wanted to go into intelligence together. Kona wanted to torture people, and Karen wanted to join r &D. She felt a little hurt that her friend didn't tell her about this then again, Kona knew of Karen's relationship with Sakura and Sakura's feelings for Sasuke. It made Karen wonder how much Kona knew about her fiancé's little fling and if she did whether or not she cared or if Sakura got hurt. Perrin looked to Eno they had only been together for a week glasses wearing girl said exasperated and what about the Chunin exams. She can't go through a life and death situation like this especially with her now ex-boyfriend on her team. Eno nodded agreeing which means we need to think of something quick before the exam, I'll sell all my favorite outfits before I allow Sakura to miss out on becoming a Chunin because of him she said, with resolve ending in venom. Of there was one thing Eno was good at she was very organized, she really didn't have the stomach for being a leader, especially if meant to let others get killed. But in another life Eno would have made a very wealthy and powerful CEO, she was a natural born manager. Perrin adjusted her glasses and was trying to think of something. Um Naruko in tone getting the other's attention, Karen became embarrassed because she had forgotten her family members were there, uh, would this be the same Sakura you mentioned in your letters? She asked. Inoichi and Inamura just stood to the side, Naruto was also up because the mother scolded her husband with kick in the shin and a psychic command, so the man helped the boy up. Surprisingly he didn't have scratch on him. Yeah Karen answered like Eno she is one of my best friends, I'm sorry cousin, but I may have to, but Karen was cut off by Naruko then let me help. Eno and Karen looked at the girl owlishly. The Inamura finally went to satisfy her curiosity, and who might you be miss? She asked the blonde girl, Inamura's face was kind, but her eyes was fixated on the girl and her headband. Oh. Sorry Mrs. Yamanaka, these are my cousins from the old country Karen said. Both adults gave a look to each other, Naruko took the K and made introductions, but she seemed to take a lot more serious and position being more professional in his manner. The girl bowed, her brother following, I am Naruko Yuzumaki, and this is my twin brother Naruto the pair rose, and there was a strange air about them, it was sympathizing. Regal and intimidating even. And we are ninja from the Storm Nation Naruko said with pride. Ino had keep herself from gaping, the twins were completely different from just a minute ago. Perrin fidgeting slightly made Ino wonder why she was nervous, her parents didn't look like they were put off, but her mother did square her shoulders, and there was slightest of clenching in her father's jaw. 
Ino mentally shrugged and just chalked it up to having foreign ninja in their shop. There was a lot of teams from most of the world in town, and everyone was on the alert. The parents looked at each other again. Inoichi and Inamura could speak to each telepathically, but after years of being married, it wasn't like they needed to read each other's minds, but then again how could anyone tell if they were or not, not even Ino had cracked that code yet. The man finally nodded which earned a sad look for his wife. Inoichi addressed to the twins with a pleasant smile, Naruto and Naruko, could tell it was real, forgive me, I'm an experienced shinobi, it is hard resisting some old habits, please forgive me and my wife for not being more welcoming, he then bowed with his wife following, Naruko only said it was alright Naruto agreeing wholeheartedly. The Yamanaka heads rose, and Inamura had her most lovely smile, I am Inamura Yamanaka, and this my husband Inoichi, and I welcome you to my humble flower shop, as well as to our country and village. Ino was flabbergasted, Karen still seemed uncomfortable, but not at all surprised by the manner in which her cousin was speaking to older couple, or the way the Yamanakas were speaking back. I understand they're foreign, but this is a bit overly formal, isn't it? Maybe Thesis exams are more important than I thought Ino wondered. And why is mom speaking for daddy? He's the head of the clan. Aruko nodded, she then turned to Ino and her cousin, hey. Let me help with your friend. Was all she said. A Ino exclaimed. It was Naruto who spoke up she's like this, you can't really stop her, she always causing trouble trying to help others Naruko pouted at her twin, you're no better Iniki, actually you're way worse. Need I remind you what happened on the find the lost ferret mission. Hmm. Naruko said with accusation. Naruto glared at his sister, I'm not the one who always tries to flip an enemy by offering them cookies. Naruko gasped those cookies were to taught to me by Bachan. They are magic remember. And besides it works, doesn't it? The one time. Shut up. Baron's shout got the two twins to shiver in fear and hold each other, for added effect her adamantine chains were out, four glowing golden black chains were poised like vipers about to strike as they swayed. K. Karen Chan calmed deep down Naruto stuttered, to him there was nothing scarier than an angry female, it was just how he was raised. The chains went away and Karen took a breath look, we gotta go take care of Sakura, Naruko if you wanna come then come, Naruto go train or something she said. How about a training partner? If that is not too much to ask. Inoichi asked. Normally a request like that would be considered suspicious, no ninja would want to reveal anything to another ninja, especially before something like the Chunin exam, but Naruto didn't seem to be all that bothered that would be awesome. The boy said. And that was how everyone parted. Three years later, with Kanoha delegation. Sakura was absolutely still. She now remembered meeting to the sweet blonde girl, if it wasn't for her kind words, Sakura would have never found the courage to make it to the exams. However there was one particular thing she could not help focusing on. And she was doing everything into her power not to strangle Ino with her long silky platinum blonde hair. The Agrip my fiancé. Sakura said lowly, she had no reason to be angry or jealous, she barely remembered the guy from exams. Naruto, an annoyingly loud and hyper shinobi, cocky and brash with the exception that he had the strength to back it up. For the love of the sage he farted in his own teammates, that dog boy, face on purpose. It took a bit of explaining from Kakashi-sensei, even he could not deny the boy's adaptability and resourcefulness. Sakura remembered what he said. Fights between ninja is never pret or dignified. It really impressive, even if they are teammates, this young man's ability to adapt so quickly is worth note, he also realized how wholly dependent the Inuzuka are on their sense of smell, this kid turned his enemy's strength into a weakness and turned his own weapons against him. This Naruto, he really is unpredictable. Sakura didn't think anything much of the Jonin statement until she was later told it wasn't Sasuke who saved her from the rampaging Jinchuriki Garabit, a foreign ninja dressed in orange. She had no reason to be mad or jealouso, why was she? Chapter 4. Wake up call. I'm sorry, Naruko-chan. Menma. Stop. Naruko shot up from her bed, but the nightmare had agitated her condition, and she immediately started coughing, as she was in her fit the door burst open, figures rushed to the side of the princess. Naruko. Two people said as they came to her side as she coughed. The light was already on as one of them flipped the switch on the lamp on the nightstand. Both were beautiful and feminine looking, the taller brunette was older by a few years and had tattoos of red fangs covering her cheeks under her big dark eyes, the other had long black hair with soulful brown eyes. Both were in their nightwear, the taller brunette was in fuzzy pajama pants and a t-shirt of some rock band, and the darker haired one was in a silk sleeping kimono that was pink. The taller one grabbed some tissues and held it to Naruko's mouth as she coughed because there was blood with each heaving choke of air. Aku, you should use your jutsu the young woman said. 
The identified Haku nodded and quickly weaved slender fingers into signs, Haku's hands glowed green and were placed on the ailing princess's back as it shook from her coughing, the oldest of the three spoke to her counterpart look after the princess, I'll go tell Ma, and she'll she was however cut off by Naruko no. She gasped out making her cough harder, your highness. Please, don't overexert yourself. Try to calm yourself, my mystic palm will help, you just try to focus on steadying your breathing. Naruko nodded at Haku and tried to focus on taking deep slow breaths, finally when the goldenrod blonde was breathing easily, Haku took the glass of water next to the pitcher on the other nightstand, the teen royal took grateful sips slowly. When she was done the princess looked to the older girl I'm fine now Hana, you don't need to bother Mrs. Zuke or the queen. Both servants looked at each other, your highness, the queen gave us orders to report immediately if you had had any more troubles with your health. Haku said gently, the jutsu was finished, now that Naruko was breathing properly, and the blood stemmed. Hana looked at her princess with worry Haku-kun is right Naruko Haim, her majesty was explicit that she be told if you ever had another attack. Please Hana Nichin. I don't want to wake up mama, dad Abara. It wasn't an attack, I just she trailed off not wanting to worry anyone. You had that nightmare again? Haku asked, knowing full well that was the case. Naruko just looked down tears welling up in her eyes please, I just don't want to worry her right now, with Naruto Anki training still, and Sakura-chan coming soon the blonde royal was obviously giving meager excuses, the truth was after every time her condition became agitated or worsened her mother got more worried, resulting in Naruko losing more of her freedom as she was restricted further. As it was Naruko was barely allowed to leave her bed let alone the palace, official functions were the only time she got to see the outside world, but really it was her mother's face, every time Naruko had the slightest cough her mother would make this worried and scared face. Naruko always thought her mother was the most beautiful woman in the world, seeing her make that concerned panicked face, it just hurt more than her condition ever could. Hana and Haku both looked at each other with trepidation, it was unwise to disobey the queen, the woman was kind and compassionate but also temperamental and downright scary, and of course she was their ruler, but the fact was they were sworn as retainers to Naruko Haim not the queen. A directive decreed by the queen herself. Hana especially, for most of her life she had been vigorously trained to be her princess's loyal bodyguard, who would give her life for the princess, what Naruko desired it was Hana's honor to fulfill even if it meant going against the queen's wishes. But it was also her job to protect the princess and do everything in her power to make sure she was cared for and stayed in as good health as they could for the rest of Naruko's life, may it be long. Hana sighed shaking her head okay, fine, as you wish my princess Naruko looked at her with her pretty smile, eyes dry and happy that Hana would oblige, but. I'm getting Dr. Namikas to come see you first thing in the morning and Ameno if she is available, is that understood? Naruko grinned, with her whisker-like marks giving her a fox-like appearance yes ma'am. Hana Nichin. The princess said saluting her own servant, both of the older attendants giggled at their beloved princess when in private there was no need for pomp and formality. That was a skill of Naruko's, most of the royal family really, she knew when to be a princess and when to relax, just being a friend, Haku got up and went to the door saying, I'll get a sedative, it should help you sleep more peacefully. Haku was back shortly with the medicine, the three chatted for a bit as they waited for the sedative to take effect, mostly of the arrival of the Kanoichi from Kanoha, the buzz had been going on for weeks, and the media was only getting more and more frenzied as the foreigner's arrival got closer. Haku and Hana were surprised that Naruko had already met her brother's future bride, and from what she said Sakura seemed like a good match, Naruko of course could trust their discretion and secrecy, so the story of Sakura's ex-boyfriend gave a predictable reaction from Hana, who had her fair share of bad boyfriends. It wasn't long before the princess felt the effects of the sedative and said she was ready to go back to sleep, so the princess's servants left their young mistress to her rest. Aku and Hana were standing outside of Naruko's room in front of the doors to their own respective bedrooms, both on the opposite wall of the other, and flanking the large ornate doors to the princess's room, centered with the long hallway lined with elegant tall floor-to-ceiling windows that showed beauty of the forested palace grounds in the center of the capital. Aku looked at Hana pensively and asked, are you still going to tell your mother? Hana sighed tiredly rubbing her eyes and the bridge of her nose, it was already late when she first went to bed as she finished some paperwork, plus the worry for her princess, whom she had been watching over ever since the young blonde girl was no older than six, it was finally draining from her nerves which was always exhausting. Yeah, I don't really have much choice, queen or not, ma is her second and will skin my ass if she finds out that I disobeyed. As much as I am uncomfortable with going behind our mistress's back, the queen still needs to know, maybe I can get my dad to do it for me. I don't know how he does it but, aside from Kashina Jam, Pa is the only person who can calm her down. Hana sighed tiredly again, needed to go to back to bed. Either way, you know as much as I do that nothing can be hidden from Her Majesty, so there's no point in trying anyway. 
No, nothing can really escape the notice of Her Majesty Kashina Jam, that is for certain Haku Satan smiled pleasantly. After three years of working together Hana knew enough by now when her partner was being mischievous, it made Hana think honestly, Haku-kun spends too much time around little bro and the first prince. I'm sure she may, perhaps, even be aware of a certain bodyguard and her secret second prince boyfriend, who have been fooling around for a few years now. Or maybe that these young lovers has been having regular threesomes with a beautiful young Kanoichi, a certain ambassador from Suna, hmm? Haku suggestively teased. The older girl blushed profusely and looked away, I don't know what you're talking about she stated a little too quickly clearing her throat to control her blush and hide her obvious reaction. Aku only smirked slightly as I understand it, they have been getting pretty serious too, the three have started becoming a real thrapple, that's why the second prince has volunteered, but before Haku could finish Hana snapped alright. I get it. She then covered her mouth realizing she was being too loud, the brown-haired young woman poked her head into the princess's chambers and sighed with relief that Naruko was still asleep. Hana glared at Haku who was smiling quite please don't worry, I gave her highness my strongest stuff, the only thing I have stronger is a senban on the right spot. Hana closed a crack in the double stained glass doors, she crossed her arms over her mildly generous bust, you of all people shouldn't be talking about someone else's love life, how about that teammate of yours? Ms. Buns of Steel there. Haku was the one to raise an eyebrow now Tenten. What about her? Not getting the point, Hana actually gapped you can't be serious, you really have no clue. The what? Ten Chan and I are very good friends now, what does that have to do with romance? I love her as a precious person if that is what you mean. Haku asked genuinely puzzled, not realizing affectionate address. Hana just stared blankly at Haku geez how dense can you be? Despite his lack of masculinity he really is a guy, no woman would be that oblivious, then again he spent most of his life on the run with a missing nin she thought. The bodyguard only shook her head at the other servant and waved it off never mind, it's late and we got work to do in the morning, the Kanoha delegation is expected sometime tomorrow, Hana said, not mentioning that they always had work to do, a royal retainer was on the clock 24-7-365. But Haku noticed the look in Hana's eyes at the mention the leaf village. Haku tilled his head ninja still make you uneasy he stated knowingly. Hana made a face crunching up her nose and twisting her mouth no, not really, I've come to accept that they are just another kind of warrior like any other more or less. I like you well enough, don't I? I mean, most gunjin like myself still use ninjutsu in small doses, and my clan still teaches the original inyazuka techniques, even though we don't use our animal partners anymore in the field. Anna just shook her head scratching her loose brown hair with claw-like nails I'm fine, I just need to get to bed she turned around and opened the door to her bedroom suite and covered a yawn good night Haku-kun. Good night Ms. Hana the androgynous young man said and went into his own room, feeling tired as well. Besides, Haku was already aware that his fellow attendant didn't like these future dealings with her place of birth, it must be very strange for her he thought. Before he could think further, he stifled a yawn of his own, Haku then shrugged forgetting about it for now and went to bed. Hana closed the door behind her and went to her own bed, three very large dogs circled around it sleeping soundly, she called them her triplets, and they were her babies. But she stopped when she realized she almost forgot something, she held up her forearms palms up and closed her eyes. As if manifesting from thin air, a sheathed katana appeared in her hands. She went over to an altar-like alcove in the wall, in it there was a stand made of dark lacquered wood. Hana reverently placed the mysterious sword onto its altar and kneeled, offering a prayer to the gods my Zanpakuten born from my very heart and imbued with my soul, through my trials, I am forged into a living weapon, may the gods keep me sharp so that I may continue to serve their will. The next morning, wave country. Ever since the intervention of a group of young ninja, the redemption and death of Zabuza Mamachi who killed Gato, a gangster who would see himself turned into a tyrant king. The land of waves has come to a peace and prosperity that it has never seen before, all of Gato's shipping company was liquidated and sold to a holdings firm, all of what was found in Gato's hideout was given back to the people, as for his ships, the whole fleet was dismantled and replaced. The new owner, an enterprising young man, replaced the old wooden sail ships with modern steel and motor cruise liners, powered by massive electric generators. The cruise liners brought much needed tourism, the new money gave the opportunity for locals to purchase new ships of their own, or resume their fishing trade. The new management even spared no expense to fix up the local town near the harbor, now known as Hashi Town, determined to make his company one that would be in service the small island nation. There was a huge boom of jobs, whether building new ships and companies or the now bustling resort trade growing on the small island, Wave Country was becoming a true destination spot and was already forgetting the hardship hat was under Gato's greed and cruelty. 
the Kanoha delegation had made it in good time and now was waiting for the escort that would take them the rest of the way to the Storm Nation, the members of Team 7 was surprised that people recognized them, the team didn't do much. While they were in wave they distributed humanitarian aid supplies, the reason why Tazuna was in Kanoha, the small act though was enough for the people to remember them. Sakura especially as she had been a great influence on the children, a little girl she had given candy to, ran right up to her and hugged her, and did some medic service for those who had been sick without treatment. The young Kanoichi had single-handedly rebooted Heath Care on the island, Sakura had been hailed as much as a hero as the ninja that saved the country, much to her embarrassment. The delegation had found a cute bed and breakfast that recently opened, that was also owned and run by a familiar face. Sasuke Chiha had most of his life planned out, whether by his clan obligations or his own goals, but no amount of planning can really prepare you for when it's finally time to cross one bridge or another. Pace and point nude young woman snuggling up against him, her breasts pleasantly pressed on his chest, he mildly noted in the back of his head, she was neither too big nor too small, maybe he can ask her bra size, hopefully she won't mind, they were married after all. Sasuke had been awake for a while, he had gotten plenty of sleep and was well rested very much so, Kona was not as subdued as other Ichiha. Maybe it was because she was half Ichiha, with her dark violet hair and aggressive, nearly violent, attitude, either way she was exceptionally uninhibited when it came to marital activities. The last few nights, they could be up until dawn, Sasuke would be so tired a few minutes is as good as a few hours. At first Sasuke thought marrying Kona would just be out of duty, like so many other arranged marriages, but Kona didn't want it to be like that and made it clear that they would at least be friends, who also had sex. They would spend the last few years of the academy getting to know each other in secret after school. They would walk home together, train together, get snacks, after nearly getting his hand stabbed, Sasuke learned to never touch Kona's precious dango, they would even sit at his favorite spot on the dock at the lake. Soon enough, they became close, love was still a strong word for both of them, even though they were married. But they cared about each other, and Sasuke honestly liked her. His new bride had to be the only girl Sasuke had ever met who didn't have an infatuation with him, not at first. In fact she would pick on him a lot when they were younger, still does, she would call him girly looking, and unmanly, she was also more dedicated to her training. They would spar in class, and she was the only student in his year that could beat him in a fight, and she never put up with any grief, especially from Sasuke. Kona was just right for him. Kona stirred and moaned a little, somehow stretching enticingly while still in her snuggled position, why do you have to wake up so early all the time? You're too loud when you think she mumbled. Sasuke grunted like he always did earning a stinging slap on his bare chest, Kona made a rule he was not allowed to respond non-verbally to her, so he responded wincing, that doesn't make sense, you can't hear my thoughts he said. Kona opened one dark onyx eye looking at his pair that matched hers I'm your wife, I can read your mind she said plainly, then closed her eye again and rubbed her soft cheek contently against his chest, Sasuke actually chuckled at that making Kona lift her head up, not liking her pillow moving and disturbing her sleep. Sasuke looked at her in the eyes, they were exactly like his, given they were Sharingan in their neutral deactivated state, but there's something about staring into her eyes it was different. It wasn't like seeing a fellow clansman, a family member, she was unique. Kona's eyes were not as cold, yet somehow more intimidating, there was a certain thrill looking into them. Sasuke knew her life, about her mother and her absent father, about her hopes and fears. They were on the same path, and they would walk it together, all that was left was stay the curse and let no one stand in their way. Kona stared at her husband for a little longer, she could honestly say she was maybe starting to love him at this point, and she knew he was starting to love her too. It was just the words that were a lot more difficult, after tying the knot and making love, how can a few words still feel softenal? But right now Kona was awake, she looked at the clock absently seeing it was 7.30, just after dawn with the sun already shining brightly. Well, if we're already both up she thought smirking. Sasuke knew that smirk, he looked at her neutrally no he only said, she looked at him unimpressed yes she replied, like it wasn't his decision. Kona took no small pleasure in the knowledge that she was the only girl who knew what Sasuke Chiha looked like when he was flustered, and mostly from being fucked. It was a lot like his broody someone pissed in my cereal look, except he blushed and his eyes darted around like he was trapped and looking for an escape. Heh, if he wasn't such an asshole all the time, I could almost see why he has so many sluts chasing him. Asshole, hum there's an Adina. He'll never let me do that to him Kona was brought out of her musings when she felt something hard poking her hip. Kona's smirk turned into a predatory grin aw, honey, do you have morning wood? She asked, like it was most innocent topic there was. Sasuke growled and looked away, stifling his urge to call his wife annoying, the last time he did that she snapped his favorite sword in half like it was a stick. 
that was an expensive sword and custom made to exactly his specifications, when she reached for another one that was even more valuable, it belonged to his grandfather, Sasuke actually got on his knees and begged for her to forgive him, Sasuke was humiliated, but he learned his lesson. Come on honey the sooner you admit you can't say no to me, the sooner you get something and I see the violet hair that you have heard, Sasuke was still looking away blushing like mad and pouting, you can't just treat me like a toy all the time and expect sex, I'm still sore from last night Kona he explained. Kona kissed his chin I know you're not used to it yet, but you will be soon enough, I can't help it if I like taking charge you're being a bit too rough. It's just my nature. We're going to my country and an Arashi women are on top speaking of which she sat up straddling her husband making Sasuke grunt as her area slid against torturing people, it seemed, got her off. We have a belief in the Storm Nation about how women should treat their men. Sasuke looked into Kona's eyes as she roughly yet slowly ground into him, he was panting already, and she was too, in Arashi, according to priestesses in the temple, a woman's man is to be treasured and protected but a man must honor and obey his woman. She leaned forward, her round perky bosom just touching his hard chest teasingly, she grabbed his hair roughly bring him up so she can hold his face in her calloused yet dainty hands, and you baby boy are all mine. Kona dove into his mouth and attacked his tongue with hers, Sasuke didn't even resist, if there was thing, Sasuke was willing to admit that he did love about his wife was that she was a strong young woman. Confident aggressive. Outside. Eno was in the hallway, walking back from the kitchen of the bed and breakfast they were staying at in Wave, Eno, after years of opening her mother's shop, developed a habit of getting up early doing chores. She slept in sometimes but not often, she just couldn't start her day without getting a task done, and since she was now sworn to serve her best friend, why not get some things done for her mistress. Eno had just went out with Tora, who was wearing a harness with a leash attached so that the feline could do her morning business. On the way back and the owner of the B&B, Tsunami, was already up making breakfast. The dark-haired woman gave Eno a strange black drink called coffee, it apparently was an import from Arashi that had been getting more popular in wave country ever since their alliance was built, it was brewed almost like hot tea, but was made with a kind of roasted bean of some kind. The hot water passed through the ground up beans instead of just dunking them. The older woman said it took her forever to get it right, Tsunami had to actually traveled all the way to the capital, Nuka Kaisho, to take a class. Tsunami said there was a few different brewing methods, and she of course bragged that she learned one of the harder ones, and they were all vastly different from steeping tea, each method giving a unique result. Tsunami used a glass beaker looking jar that had a brim shaped like a funnel, you put a paper filter in the funnel with a measured amount of coffee and pour hot water over the coarsely ground beans, the kettle was odd looking with a long slender spout that curved like the neck of a swan. Well, when Eno tried the coffee, it was very bitter, but the flavor alone filled her with energy, Tsunami stirred in some sugar and milk into hers and offered some to Eno, the younger teen liked it this way much better. The platinum blonde had a feeling that coffee was a part of her life now. The B&B keeper made up a tray for Eno to take up to Sakura and Karen, Eno had thanked her and went back up to her two best friends. Unfortunately. As she was walking down the hall, which according to Sakura was much longer than her last visit to Tsunami's house, there must have been a remodel, as Ino passed the door occupied by a pair of Ichiha newlyweds, she heard something that was well. Oh, gods. Yes. Come on pretty boy, give mommy what she wants. Ah. Fuck. K Kona. Please, you're too ah. Too rough. Come on sugar. You can do it. You can do it. Ah. Oh fucking sage. Yes. Give it to mommy. I'm cooming. Eno was blushing madly, both out of embarrassment and irritation, the former Yamanaka still didn't forgive them. Sasuke for being just a plain asshole most of their lives and for leading Sakura on. But Kona, Eno had learned it was her idea for Sasuke to go out with Sakura, Karen as Kona's teammate had gotten her side. Some sob story about being sent away from home by her mother, who still visited often, an abusive father who ran off and being forced into an arranged marriage so that she can have a Kanoha citizenship. Kona just wanted to see what it was like to actually date around, she told Sasuke to go on a few dates too, but he only went out with just Sakura. Ino hated that she couldn't fault them for trying to work it out or doing what newlyweds do on what technically was their honeymoon, a working one, but then again there wasn't anything stopping her either. Sage damned Ichiha, going at it so early in the morning, not caring about who might be Ino's voice stopped working when her blood went cold as her stomach dropped, she quickly went to her room that she was sharing with Sakura and Karen right next door to Sasuke's and Kona's. Ino balanced the tray on one hand, mad shop girl skill, and opened the door to her temporary quarters, she saw exactly what she was afraid of, Sakura was awake sitting up on the bed they were sharing holding her knees up to her chest. Oh honey was all Ino could say as she placed the tray of coffee on a small O table in front of a couch. Ino went to Sakura's side and held her, I'm fine Ino Sakura mumbled, Ino frowned not believing her. 
It was finally quiet now and Eno could hear the shower in the attached bathroom running, it must have been Karen, sure enough the bathroom door opened up out walked Karen. Iridi put on her glasses and saw her friends oh he was hoping you slept through that she said. She made her way over to her bed, they could only get a two bed because there wasn't anything bigger, and she got her own bed because she was uncomfortable sleeping with other girls. Must have been quieter in the shower Sakura tried to joke, Karen just smiled at her joking back cold shower she said teasingly, both Sakura and Ino blushed at the other girl and what she was implying. You see Karen was pansexual, she didn't care what the other person was, as long as they was a warm body and relatively attractive to her, but she preferred only one person at a time. Only a few people knew of Karen's tastes like Lady Tsunade, her sensei Shizun, and her mother. The unfortunate thing was homosexuality, transgender, etc. Was still not accepted in most parts of the world, especially in hidden villages where the size of a fighting force is dependent on how many babies are born, it wasn't like Karen didn't want child wrench thinks. But Sakura and Ino were the first to accept, they loved their best friend no matter what, it just so happened Ino was her first kiss, she wanted to know if she was bi or gay too, she wasn't, but it was exciting. Kanoha was the best of them, at the most marriage between partners of the same sex wasn't legal, but in other countries and villages you could face imprisonment. Or an I was kiss execution. Hey. Is that coffee? Sweet nine goddesses, do you know how hard it is to get this stuff north of flower country? It's been ages since I had any, mom never told me who her supplier was before she died. Karen sat on the couch still in her towel and poured herself a cup, she drank it black like a true coffee aficionado reveling in the taste, she sighed happily, finally having her true love back. Nina rolled her eyes, oh come on don't tell me you still have a crush on those two. Karen always denied it, but she was a bit of a closet pervert, something Ino teased her about a lot. The former Yamanaka was convinced Karen also had a crush on Sasuke, like so many other girls, and later Kona, but Karen would vehemently deny it. Karen would have raved angrily, but finally having her beloved coffee after so long she was in too much in a good mood. Look Eno, just because someone is admittedly hot doesn't mean you have to have a crush on them, I can separate physical attraction my own feelings. My horny from heart. Wish I learned how to do that Sakura side. Eno and Karen looked at her bug-eyed, they never thought in a million years the pincat would ever admit that her feeling were just a horny crush. Sakura looked at them seriously let's face it, I only liked him because of his looks and because he was cool she admitted. Karen looked at Eno and the other back, they pretty much agreed that was the case, but Sakura had enough insecurities and self-doubt as it was. Karen put her mug down sweetie she said looking at her best friend, that may be the case, but that doesn't mean how you felt wasn't any less real, maybe it was in wrong place and for the wrong reasons but he were important to you and that's all that matters. Sakura smiled appreciating Karen's insight, the other girl was kin to their group's mom in her own right. Thanks Karen, sometimes you're just like your mom, you sound like her you know that. Karen smirked playfully goodness, that means I have to adopt Eno, what am I going to do to do with a daughter who's a bad spray tan from becoming a gyre she lamented. Hey. Eno said in anger, Karen looked at the blonde like she was scolding a child, don't you hey me young lady, look at you, aren't you supposed be a lady in waiting? And you're just sitting there talking about crushes while Sakura-chan's coffee gets cold, my goodness. Yeah I know it, what's coffee? And the banter went on for a few more minutes as they all got dressed, while Karen and Ino taught Sakura about the miraculous brew, Sakura was believer at first sip, the girls went down to breakfast and enjoyed it with the rest of the delegation. So, you're going to marry a prince Sakura-san, how wonderful. Tsunami gushed. She was a slender woman in typical housewife's clothes, with long black hair and a simple but no less stunning beauty, it's like a fairy tale. Sakura nervously laughed, feeling embarrassed, ah w well she tried to say. What could she say? By all means it really was a fairy tale, certainly felt unrealistic, but there was a huge difference between a story and living it in real life. Don't worry Sakura ni, Naruto Nai is a great guy. Inari said happily, the bucket hat wearing boy seemed to worship the prince as a personal hero. His face then got dark and ominous, but if he ever hurts you, I will hurt him, Inari also had a little crush on his Nichin. Oh, Sakura-san. My beautiful Sakura-san. Lee wailed to have you taken away by a foreign stranger. He then got serious holding up his fist I must fight him and win you back. Or at very least make him prove his worth to be Lee could not go on as golden chains and black snakes came at him on both sides. Karen was using her adamantine chains with their sharp points aimed at his eyes and Kona was using her mother's hidden shadow snake hands aimed at his crotch. If there was one thing the edge and torture queens of Kanoha hated more than anything else it was misogyny. Men thinking they could just win a woman like she was a prize, as if she was an object, both had an Arashi heritage where courtship was sacred. 
Junin Li Tsunade said in her most commanding Hokage's voice, from this point on you will remain silent unless spoken to, and then you will keep your responses brief and at a low volume she said, growling out that last bit. The fifth Hokage looked around at all present. Besides Sakura and her group and the newly wedded Ichiha, there was Makoto Ichiha present to represent the clan lords, the sensei of the three teams that graduated Sakura's year, Shizun excluded, and Team 9, the Daimyo and his staff, and the remaining two elders of Tsunade's advisors. There was also what remained of the teams, a few were missing due to Sai turning out to be a brainwashed drone, and Karen's teammate Shino taking over for his late father's position as clan head, Team 9 was also missing their Kanoichi member, as she had resigned her commission claiming, I can't fucking take it anymore, I never want to hear the word youth ever again. Everyone must be on their best behavior, Arashi is not like any country you have seen before, its people and culture are very different from the rest of the world. The Royal Uzumaki clan most importantly, they are an aggressive and wild clan to say the least, the biggest reason we are trying to avoid war and make peace with them is because Arashi's military main specialty is conquering other countries. The Queen, Her Majesty Kashina Jam, in particular has a very volatile temper, and she has been known to execute anyone that has insulted her on the spot most of the time by her own hand. Everyone looked around nervously, Sakura was especially scared, the Queen was supposed to be mother-in-law soon. Well, Tsunade Chan the fire daimyo said in a lazy and uncaring manner, I'm sure Kashina is a reasonable woman. Tsunade tried not to frown at her feudal lord, she never liked him, he was ineffective as a ruler and worse. Daimyo sama. There is no doubt that this Yuzumaki woman will be honored to be in alliance and serve his lordship. One of the daimyo's advisors stated. Tsunade cleared her throat, I'm sure her majesty understands the benefits of this union, but I must remind his lordship that the storm nation is a true monarchy. There is no feudal lords and has not recognized the daimyo since the fall of the shogunate, most of all the people the storm nation pride themselves on liberty and constitutional rights, I would advise that his lordship remember that this alliance is between Kanoha and the Yuzumaki clan, as we the only recognized military might, and we cannot afford to go into a costly war with them. The Yuzumaki's personal army, the Guntai, is very powerful even more than our own. If we were to go to war with them, Tsunade was however cut off by Himura. We would still win as we are ninja, and this guntai has no knowledge of ninjutsu, I assure you Daimyo-sama, these brutes will surely see that the hidden leaf and his lordship are a power they cannot compare and will be grateful to his lordship. Tsunade glared her two advisors and their ignorance, but she kept quiet as the fire Daimyo was quite pleased with the untrue statement. Sakura noticed that Karen too was not happy with the elder's statement either. Breakfast continued and it was decidedly steered away from politics. At 10 o'clock Sakura and her friends were in the family's private living room, closed off from the rest of the renovations, so Tsunami and her family can have a space to themselves, suddenly Ino perked up a bit looking around what that hell is that? She asked. At first no one knew what she was talking about, that was until Sakura heard a steady thrumming noise and it was getting louder. Tsunade looked up smiling, it appears our escort has arrived. She got up and out to the front yard, followed by the rest of the delegation, the yard was a very large patch of grass as big as a training ground, the wind was picking up, and the noise was getting louder, making chuha 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 sound. It was Eno who so elegantly stated what everyone was thinking. What the fuck is that? What if Kagail Tatsuki give all chakra to Naruto, and thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part comment down and thanks for watching the video and see you guys next video.